This is a world unlike our own. It is a magical realm, and it is called so because everyone can use magic at will. It has become an integral part of daily life, and a person's social status is dependent on their control over magic. In a world where magic is the norm, there are still some exceptions, some very strange exceptions that go against the natural order of things. This is Mosh. He lives with his pops, Regro Burndad. He is a 75-year-old man who lives in the woods, far away from other people. He talks about his peaceful life when suddenly his door is ripped off its hinges. Mosh walks in and gets yelled at for breaking the door. He couldn't help it. He forgot whether it was pull or push, but he promises to fix it. He is so innocent that it is hard to stay mad at him. But he doesn't seem to be too good at fixing doors and ends up breaking it. He still promises to fix it, but Pops has already accepted his broken door. They sit down to talk about Mosh's training and Mosh asks why he only does physical training. Pops knows that the reason is Mosh's inability to use magic, but he doesn't want to say that, so he goes on an errand and leaves Mosh in charge of the house. He gives his one final warning. While I'm out, do not enter the city and Mosh promises to listen. But the second Pops leaves, Mosh looks at a flyer for cream puffs and bolts out towards the city. He can't ignore the call of an empty stomach. Mosh walks into town with a cloak over his head. He notices everyone around him using magic to perform their tasks, but remarks that they could just use their hands instead. He arrives at the cream puff stall and orders his cream puffs. But when it comes time to pay, he had accidentally squeezed the coins so hard that they bent. The stall owner is shocked after all what kind of person can bend coins in their palm, just because they got excited. Mosh says he will fix the coins and begins to straighten them with his bare fingers. This is too much for the stall owner to handle. As Mosh prepares to leave, a gust of wind blows his cloak off and everyone begins to stare at him. Something seems to be wrong, but no one wants to talk about it. Meanwhile, at the police station, an officer is reading, or rather watching the newspaper, it tells of a student, Rain Amos, who became a divine visionary, one who stands at the top of the magic world. He is jealous of such an exciting life, while he is stuck with his dull life. A man is seen begging to be released, all he did was steal, so if his punishment shouldn't be so severe, that the officer has no mercy to give, it's about to beat him up when the phone rings. There's a call regarding an unmarked boy in the city. Mosh continues to walk through the city wondering why everyone is staring at him so much, when he bumps into a drunk police officer staining his uniform. The man goes off on a rant about protecting the people and receiving no thanks for it, so Mosh offers him a half-eaten cream puff. The man is insulted by Mosh's actions and knocks the cream puff out of his hand. He asks Mosh what he's going to do about his uniform, so Mosh rips it off his body. He had only intended to take it and wash it for him, but ripped it off in the process. It is at this moment that the other officer shows up. His name is Brad Coleman, and he recognizes Mosh as the unmarked boy from the report. But just as he is about to arrest Mosh, Pop shows up and snatches Mosh away. Brad is happy to finally get some excitement and casts a spell to track Mosh and Pops back to their home. Back at home, Pops yells at Mosh for going to the city after he was specifically warned not to do that. Mosh looks really sorry, so it is still hard to stay mad at him. As punishment, he makes Mosh do that morning's training routine again. Mosh agrees and hands Pops the cream puffs he bought that day and heads towards the door. Pops gets flashbacks of that morning and runs to open the door for Mosh to avoid breaking it again. Pops thinks Mosh is a good kid, he is mostly obedient and very kind. He has managed to keep him safe until now by keeping him away from the world of magic. But now that he has been found out, they have to move. Just as he is thinking about this, he notices the tracking spell outside his window. Followed shortly by a blast through his wall, it is Brad and the other officers. Elsewhere in the forest, Mosh is doing his workout routine with ease and style, even the squirrels can't believe what they are seeing. He finishes the workout in under five minutes and heads back to eat some cream puffs, but as he gets to the door, he hears Brad threatening Pops. Pops had hidden Mosh from the world because he couldn't use magic, but in this world, those who cannot use magic are to be disposed of, and hiding magicless people is considered a serious crime. Even still, Pops refuses to give Mosh to them, he is prepared to die to protect him. All his life, he was called useless, failed over and over, and the world didn't need him. He was about to end it when he heard a baby crying that day, he swore that he would take care of that boy. He yells for Mosh to run away, but Mosh busts through the door and punches one officer out. He then rips off the shirt of the other one and slaps him around. Pops asks why he didn't run away and Mosh apologizes for being selfish, but since he is here, he is going to take down Brad. Brad charges up a spell that once drove away a dragon and fires at Mosh, but Mosh just swats it away. He launches another powerful spell, but Mosh swats it away again. He launches another one, but Mosh catches it like a volleyball. He launches even more, but Mosh is now juggling them and dribbling them. 
He then picks up Pop's wand and throws it at Brad. It breaks through Brad's force field. Brad is impressed and intrigued. He makes a deal with Mosh. If he goes to Easton Magic Academy and becomes the divine visionary, he will let them go. All he wants is the money and game that comes with it, and Mosh agrees. Easton Magic Academy is a prestigious school, which has produced several divine visionaries over the years. Of course, with such prestige, the entrance exam would be incredibly difficult to pass. It is said to only admit 3% of applicants and only the best magic users can ever hope to attend. Before the exam, the exam administrator, Claude Lucci, is looking at all the applicants and judging their fitness for the school. He expects them to be preparing for the exam diligently. But what he doesn't expect is to see a kid pumping iron in the middle of the field. He thinks he must be imagining things. There is no way that anyone is crazy enough to be pumping iron at a magic school entrance exam. But there is the proof, Mosh Bernadette, and behind him are Pops and Brad. He decides to forget about him for now. After all, a slacker like him will never pass the exam. He then teleports to the front of the field and introduces himself to the students. The students are praising his achievements and he is loving every minute of it, however, Mosh couldn't care less who he was. He is a little irritated by Mosh but decides to begin the exam and tells the students to take their seats. There are no seats to speak of, but he then creates some out-of-earth magic, followed by papers and quills falling from the sky. The students are once again in awe, but Mosh is unimpressed. He is starting to hate Mosh. The students begin the test. But the words on the test papers keep moving around. It is impossible to finish unless you cast a spell to stop the words from moving around. Mosh is getting annoyed by the words moving and kindly asks them to stop. And as if they knew what happened to the door, they became scared and straightened out. Mosh finishes his test and Claude is surprised to see that he passed. He was sure that Mosh would fail, but his test was perfect. And through the rest of the tests, Mosh performs well. He makes a boulder float, he runs on water, and does a bunch of other stuff to shock everyone. Claude is really angry that Mosh is still there. He starts to think of ways to get rid of him and begins the next test. It is a large maze with dozens of traps laid out everywhere. Mosh thinks this test is pretty easy. He is approached by a girl, Lemon Irvin, who wants to tag along with him. He agreed to let her tag along, but she is a bit of a mess. She fell into every trap they came across and constantly needed Mosh to save her. It turns out that this entire thing has been a trap. She was put up to slow and mosh down by Claude and cast a spell to put handcuffs on Mosh. She's very sorry, but she needs to do this for her and her family's sake. Mosh realizes that he has been tricked and easily breaks out of his handcuffs and runs off to finish the exam. As soon as he leaves, he is confronted by the Sphinx. She is powerless against it and can't answer its riddle. She is doomed. She wants to ask for help, but she knows she doesn't deserve any. She tricked Mosh and tried to make him fail his exam. She deserves what she is getting. Just before she is hit, Mosh arrived and punched the Sphinx to death. He forgives Lemon because he can relate to doing whatever you have to in order to succeed. With time running out, Mosh decides to take the shortest path to the goal. A straight line. He breaks through the walls of the maze and makes it to the goal. The other students are understandably upset that Mosh didn't do the exam properly. They start booing him and Mosh is shaken by their hurtful words. Lemon speaks up and tells everyone that Claude attempted to get her to make Mosh fail. But Mosh, even after learning this, still helped her and said, please marry me. Mosh denies ever proposing to her, but in her mind that is exactly how it happened. Claude is still determined to fail them and challenges them thinking that there is no way he can lose. But Mosh appears in front of him and breaks his wand. Just then, the headmaster shows up and takes over the examination. He questions Mosh about his motives for attending their school. He answers to live in peace with my family. He is asked why he chose to save Lemon even though he didn't have time. His answer was, I felt like I would regret it. The headmaster thinks Mosh is the type of person to act before thinking much about things. He then asks him what he would do if he was faced with more powerful opponent like him. He then unleashed a spell which traps the soul of the target's loved one in a doll, aka pops, and lowers a spike onto it. Mosh tries to punch the spike, but doesn't do anything, so he resolves to hold the spike up until the headmaster ran out of stamina. The headmaster is very impressed by Mosh's will to help others. Power should be used to protect the weak, and Mosh is the perfect person to do that. He apologizes and cancels his spell, and Pops wakes up. He allows Mosh to enter the academy as a student. In the academy, Mosh is being taught how to open a lock with magic, but he just opens it by ripping it apart. The teacher is yelling at Mosh, and a student, Finn Amos, is hoping that you will not have to deal with Mosh much. He heads to his dorm room later and notices the door is gone. Mosh got there first, and another door bites the dust. They are roommates from now on, so Mosh introduces himself and his muscles. Mosh is eating cream puffs as usual. When he asks Finn to borrow his broom, they will be having a broom flying test later, and he forgot to bring his broom with him. 
Finn is shocked at how a magic student can forget to bring their broom, but agrees to let him borrow his own. The students gather in the field and begin their lesson. The teacher instructs them to make their brooms float by stating the command, fly. The other students do this with varying rates of success, but Mosh can't get his broom even slightly off the ground. He is being mocked by everyone, so he stomps on the ground, causing his broom to fly up due to the shock. The next part of the test is a time trial. You must go from one point to another as fast as you can on your broom. A student who was mocking him challenges him to a race, and to make it a little interesting, the loser has to listen to anything the winner orders him to do. Mosh agrees, and they get ready to race. The student is fairly confident in himself because he has been riding brooms since he was a kid, therefore he should have no trouble being a novice in a race. The race starts, and in an instant Mash is at the finish line. It is a new world record. At the start, Mash chucked his broom and jumped forward, he then mounted the broom mid-air and finished the race before the other student could even get a chance to move. He can't accept his loss and out of pity, Mash drops the bet. He is still yelling when another student comes over and uses a spell to force him to keep quiet. The student's name is Lloyd Cavill, but all that Mosh hears is Spud Cabbage. Lloyd is visibly annoyed by this and tells Mosh to come back after school, but Mosh doesn't seem to understand what is going on. Lloyd leaves with his friend and starts to beat him up for losing to Mosh in the race. His hands are covered in blood, but he is happy that he gets to play with Mosh next. Later, Mosh asks Finn why everyone was afraid of Lloyd and Finn, tells him that Lloyd is the son of a high-ranking official at the Bureau of Magic. The Bureau of Magic is an absolute authority in this world, and even the vice principal of the school is said to be related to Lloyd, so in the school, Lloyd holds tremendous power. Anyone who gets on his bad side is expelled, and even after they are expelled, they are still tormented. That is why everybody fears him. After school, Mash is busy making cream puffs, something he really enjoys. He feels like he is forgetting something, but he can't put his finger on it. It was Lloyd, and he is very angry now. The next day, Mash is in his classroom when he finds his textbook destroyed. Lloyd shows up and asks him why he didn't show up the previous day, and Mosh tells the truth, he was making cream puffs. Lloyd asks him if he wants to become a divine visionary. He says he will put a good word for Mosh if he obeys him. Mosh does want to become a divine visionary, so he agrees to Lloyd's proposal. He is now tasked with performing menial tasks for Lloyd's amusement. In the next class, he notices that his textbook is torn up again, so he asks Finn to share his own with him. Finn is against it at first, but Mosh does it anyway. Mosh also thanks Finn for letting him borrow his broom earlier, he's glad to have such a good friend. Lloyd is still toying with Mosh, he deliberately makes a mess, and then orders Mosh to clean it up. Mosh cleans it so well that it sparkles, but then he notices that he never gave Finn his textbook back. He rushes to return the book to Finn, but finds Lloyd talking to Finn. It turned out that Finn was the one destroying Mosh's books, and now Lloyd wants him to burn Mosh's clothes, but Finn has had enough, he doesn't want to betray Mosh anymore. Lloyd doesn't like this and uses his spell on Finn to make him injure himself. Finn apologizes to Mosh and confesses to what he has been doing. Mosh is angry, he grabs Lloyd by the hair and plants his face into the ground. Mosh now realizes that what he just did could possibly get him expelled. Just then, the vice principal shows up and threatens Mosh with expulsion. Even though Lloyd has done much worse, he ignores it and only seeks to punish Mosh. He is still in the middle of his speech, when Mosh knees him in the face, he didn't seem open to reasoning so Mosh decided it was for the best. The vice principal tries to fight back, but Mosh throws dirt in his face, then Mosh sticks him in a hole and starts to bury him. Even if the vice principal can expel him at any time, Mosh can bury him any time. As expected, Mosh is summoned to a disciplinary meeting later, an order for his expulsion has been placed, but the headmaster believes Mosh has done nothing wrong. So he burns the order, he wishes Mosh luck in becoming a divine visionary and tells him how he can do it. He needs to collect coins that he can win by completing events or performing well. Once he gets enough coins, he can take part in the divine visionary competition. Mosh becomes recognized by the other students because he was able to take down Loy who was seen as untouchable in the school, and because of this, he is later approached by Tom, who is the school's sports MVP, to participate in the upcoming Duello event with him. Duello is an aerial sport where students fly on brooms and throw a ball into a goal, however, Mosh cannot use magic, so he cannot fly. Tom comes down and asks Mosh why he isn't doing anything yet. He promised that he would be number one, but Mosh made no promises, in fact, he still doesn't know the rules of the game he is playing. Tom seems to be a little crazy, but he is just hyped for the game. He explains the rules of the game to Mosh. The players fight for control over the ball while flying on their broomstick. No magic can be used to help you, you must throw the ball through the goal. With that, he prepares to take off but is knocked out by another student on the opposing team. 
The student says it was an accident, but it was purely intentional. Adler is down by 40 points with little time left, and now Tom has broken a bone. There is not much hope left for victory. Tom tells Mosh to just have fun. It is not all about winning. Mosh finally decides to give it his all. He grabs his broom and leaps into the air. He then stops mid-air and appears to be flying. But in reality, he is just kicking his legs really fast to fly. He gets his team to pass him the ball, but there is no way he can make it through the defenders. But he doesn't intend to get through them, he just throws the ball really fast, and it blows past the defenders into the goal, and back into Mosh's hand. Mosh puts spin on the ball to make it come back to him, and then he throws it again, over and over, and over, until he scores over 900 points. With that, Adler has won the match with a new world record, and Mosh receives a silver coin. Tom comes over menacingly and gives Mosh a hug, he is so proud of Mosh for winning. Meanwhile, another student watches the newspaper and recognizes Mosh to be from the entrance exam. He seems to be quite angry at Mosh for some reason. The next day, Tom comes to get Mosh to train for the next duello tournament. But Mosh never agreed to play again, while Lemon is trying to get him to study for class. While they are pestering Mosh, the student, Lance Crown, walks up to them and interrupts. He was the first place in the entrance exam and is so hot that Lemon almost falls for him. But she is already in love with Mosh. Lance pulls out a magic bottle which traps the others inside it. He tells Mosh to meet him in the forest if he wants his friends back. Lance is a little special, where most people have one magic line, there are very few that have two, and those who possess two have far more magic power than normal people would have. Lance bets his silver coins against Mosh to start a duel. He plans to use Mosh's friends as leverage in order to win the match. Mosh is getting impatient and asks him to start the match already, so Lance casts his spell, Gravity Magic. The ground is destroyed by the increased gravity, and even Pops and Brad that are hiding in the forest are affected by its damage. However, Mosh is still standing, he lunges forward to attack Lance, but Lance is unimpressed that he still intends to fight without magic. He unleashes an even stronger gravity spell, and Mosh is thrown to the ground under the immense pressure he is feeling. Lance mocks Mosh for acting half-heartedly. Do you have no aspirations at all? He asks, yet Mosh possesses a silver coin. If he doesn't intend to make use of his opportunity, he should leave the battle for more motivated people to take over. Lance intends to be the last one standing him and no one else. Mosh tries to stand up, but Lance says it is futile. No human can overcome such gravity. But Mosh doesn't need to stand. He pulls a root out from underground and makes Lance fall over. Mosh goes in for another attack, and Lance casts the same spell again. But this time, Mosh is able to overcome it and manages to punch Lance's locket off his neck. He opens the locket and sees a picture of a little girl. Mosh is now worried that Lance might be a lolicon. Maybe he should call the police. Lance explains that the picture is of his sister. She is sick with a disease that causes one to lose their magic, and when his parents found out, they were prepared to abandon her. So he seeks to become a divine visionary to help his sister. He is not a lolicon. He is a siskon. He holds the bottle over the edge of the cliff and plans to drop it. He will then use his magic to make the bottle fall faster. He knows Mosh will try to save his friends and when he does, he will attack him. Mosh is ready and in a running stance, even if he sympathizes with Lance, he cannot afford to lose either. As Lance drops the bottle, Mosh calls out, hamstring magic and proceeds to run down the cliff and back up in less than a second. After coming back, Mosh wants to call off the duel. Lance isn't really a bad guy, he threw a decoy bottle, meaning he had no intention of harming anyone. Mosh speeds up to Lance and searches his clothes for the real bottle, and after retrieving it, he wants to call it a day. Lance asks why, and Mosh answers that maybe he is just clumsy like that. Those words remind Lance of his sister, and he decides to call it a day. He did make a bet, so he gives Mosh his silver coin because he lost and walks off. In Easton Academy's dormitory, there are three houses, Adler, Orca, and Lang, and these three houses are rivals with one another. In the Adler dorm, Mash and Finn are sitting together. Mash now has two silver coins, and when one gathers five silver coins, they get one gold coin. They take in the peaceful serenity of the day, there's nothing better than having nothing to do. But wait, they actually have an assignment to submit. Finn and Mash forgot all about their potions assignment, and if they don't submit it, their grades will fall into dropout range. Mash tries to calm Finn down by offering him a cream puff, but now isn't the time for snacks. The two despair over having to do the assignment when Lance walks in. He scolds them for wasting time and not doing the assignment. The two ask him if he has already finished it, but of course he has, he is the top student in their class, he would never procrastinate on his assignments. He doesn't want to help them and continues to scold them, but then Mosh shows him a picture of his sister which overloads his brain and sends him flying back into a wall. Lance decides to help them. He shows them a mandragora, a plant that looks like a screaming radish. Once you manage to silence its screams, it can be used as a universal potion ingredient. 
The same applies in real life too, trust me. Lance demonstrates a spell to make the radish go to sleep. This makes it much easier to murder the plant, but Mosh is apprehensive because he can't use magic. Finn is able to pull the spell off with relative ease, but Mosh only manages to make the plant scream louder. I don't know how he did it, but he made the plant turn into a huge monster. The plant monster attacks, but Mosh just slaps it to knock it out. Now that all the plants have been incapacitated, it's time to prepare them. Lance shows off his salt bay skills and creates the potion. He now wants Mosh and Finn to do the same. Mosh copies Lance perfectly, but it somehow turns into a cream puff. Lance tries to help him and walks him through every step carefully. Yet before his eyes, it still turned into a cream puff. That's a whole different kind of magic. Mosh is useless when it comes to anything other than fighting or making cream puffs, but he has already accepted that. Lance declares that he will never lose to Mosh again, and Mosh is happy to accept the challenge. Elsewhere, a redhead guy bumps into some students. The students make a perfectly reasonable request for an apology, and in response, the guy beats them to a pulp. And in another part of the school, Langdorm holds what I can only describe as a cult meeting about divine visionaries. Their leader issues an order to collect all the coins. The next day, class is held in the forest as Mosh and the others wonder what they are going to do in the forest. The redhead comes walking up with a serious case of main character syndrome. His name is Dot Barrett. He believes the world revolves around him and walks up to Mosh to denounce him as the true main character. But then he sees Lemon walk up to Mosh and gets a grave reminder of the difference between the two of them. He goes on a rant about how he hates guys who get attention from girls, but Lemon makes it worse when she says that she will marry Mosh. The teacher calls everyone's attention to begin class. He tells them that their task is to defeat a forest scorpion. Dot takes this as a chance to win against Mosh and gets started. Mosh is then attacked by a second year student, Sotla from Langdorm. This student is notorious for misconduct. He has injured several students and teachers alike. Mosh is hit with a stone spike and gives Silva a death stare. Later, we find out that the reason he was angry was because he thought he had squished the cream puff in his jacket. Lance wants to pair up with Mosh for the task. But Mosh zoned out a while ago and got lost pretty fast. Mosh runs into Dot, who is still talking trash about Mosh, but he quickly gets him to shut up with a slap. He hears a girl crying for help and he saves her. But now he is obviously simping. The girl is playing him like a fiddle. She used her magic to make him fall madly in love with her, but he probably still would have fallen in love without the magic. She tries to do the same thing to Mash, but he is completely immune because he couldn't care less about her. She is upset that she can't charm Mash, but she still managed to get Dot, so she baits him into fighting the guy from before, and it works. Dot attacks with all he has, he launches a flurry of explosions, and finishes it off with one final explosion, but it doesn't do anything. Silva defended himself with rock magic and mocks Dot for being weak. Silva really enjoys beating reality into people who are delusional and think that they are special. He then casts a spell that strikes Dot right in the gut and brings him to his knees. Things are looking grim for Dot. He is finally starting to realize that maybe he isn't the main character of this show. Silva issues a challenge. If Dot can survive 10 direct hits, then he'll leave them alone, and he agrees to it. He is pounded really bad by the long, hard rocks, but at the end of it, he is still standing upright. But that doesn't last for long as he falls faster than Crypto. And to add insult to injury, the girl who he took a beating for mocks him for simping for her. Even I'm starting to feel bad for Dot. Mash has seen enough, and even though he doesn't particularly like Dot, he feels just as bad for him as I do, so he shuts Silva up and takes on the challenge as well. Silva tries to pound him too, but at the end, Mash is still standing and he ain't going down like Crypto. Now it's his turn, he catches the next pillar attack and crushes it, before going in with his triceps and closing in on Silva. It was at this moment he knew he fucked up. Silva got his face caved in like a failed souffle. I'll be damned if he doesn't have some brain damage after that. Silva tries to fight back, but Mash just goes to get that weak shit out of my face and gut checks him. Silva is reeling on the floor in agony, coughing up blood and contemplating his life choices. Then Mash goes for extra style points, he sits on a tree in the most menacing manner and tells him he is still gonna get hit eight more times. But then a ray of hope appears for Silva, a giant scorpion appears and he thinks he can escape while the thing attacks Mash, but Mash just back end bitch slaps the scorpion away. Now Silva knows he's really screwed, Mash then turns his attention to the girl, and she tries to use her sip magic on Mash, but he ain't no simp. These hands are rated E for everyone. Now that all that is over, the others rejoin Mash and Dot apologizes for getting him caught up in that. Maybe now he'll have some character development and give up simping, but no. One look at Lemon and he's back to simping. Once a simp, always a simp. Lance sheds some light on the Landorm. They are made up of a bunch of elitists who want to prevent the normal people from getting into the Magic Bureau and will try to take anyone's gold coin. Mash now has a gold coin, so Lang's dorm will definitely be coming after him. 
but Mash forgot that there were even other dorms at all. On the day when their dorms were decided, Mash had one thing on his mind, cream puffs, a sea of cream puffs, where he laid and said it's cream puffing time. Okay, I made that up, but the skeleton horse that was meant to sort through Mash's thoughts was really confused by the cream puffs, and had to do some Olympic-level mental gymnastics to sort Mash. Later, Mash is lost in the school, when he stumbles upon Abel's meeting where Silva was just turned into a puppet for losing to Mash. Mash is questioned by Abel on why he wants to become a divine visionary, but he is a simple man. All he wants is to live in peace with his family. And this answer doesn't seem to satisfy Abel, who then goes on his elitist rant about how magic is everything and those without it should be killed. Mash doesn't get it, and Abel feels insulted. He threatens Mash to give up his gold coin in exchange for his freedom, but Mash says nah. Abel uses the Silva puppet to attack Mash, but just like before, Mash just gives him more brain damage. Next, Abel pulls out a more beefy puppet to restrain Mash and take his coin. Mash then gets thrown into a wall and gives up the fight. He'll just take Silva to the infirmary for brain damage. Mash leaves without further trouble, and Abel wonders why that was so easy. But then he opens his hand and realizes that he has been duped, finessed, bamboozled, and all around played. Mash swapped out the coin for a button with superhuman speed and all of it, done with his mouth alone. Mash takes Silva to the infirmary, but the grind never stops, and those obliques aren't going to work themselves. Silva wakes up to Mash mid-workout, and aside from the obvious confusion of why Mash is working out here, he also wants to know why Mash saved him even after what he did, but Mash is just kind like that. Meanwhile, Lance and Dot have a stare down in Mash and Finn's room, they are displeased with each other and prepare to battle to kick each other out when Mash breaks the door to enter again. Poor Dorkun. Mash's arrival settles them down, but they are still far from on the same page. Just then, Lemon walks into the room with news, but then she realizes that there are four guys and one girl in the room, and you know what? I can't really explain it. But she must have some wild fantasies. Back to reality, she tells them that Langdorm has almost all the gold coins and have been collecting other people's coins since the beginning of the year. Someone has to put a stop to this, and it's going to be them. But first, Mash has to clean the owl huts, since that was the punishment he received from the headmaster. Lance decides to help him, so if Lang tries to attack Mash for his coin, he can help. Meanwhile, two Langdorm students approach, and one drops some profound wisdom every 60 seconds a minute passes. The two guys are Andrew, who's got non-existent lip game and answer, who actually looks rather normal. Mash is drowning in Andrew's spell, and then Andrew turns into a shark to go after Mash. Answer is left with Lance, and Answer drops some more dope wisdom, people die when they are killed. Answer's spell only affects his shuriken, so gravity magic should be very effective, but the owls will also be harmed if he uses it. Answer has a major superiority complex, and he thinks that since Lance isn't fighting back, then he must be superior, but he was wrong. Once the owls are moved away, Lance demonstrates his superiority and crushes Answer under the weight of his spell. They may both have two lines, but Lance is fueled by the love of his sister. Back to Mash, Andrew is still looking for him, when something flies by him at an incredible speed. Mash thought he couldn't swim, but it turns out that he can, he can even talk underwater. And Andrew can turn into a shark. Yeah, I think we know who's winning this fight. Mash and Lance stand victorious over the bodies and take their coin, but then a mysterious masked man makes his way past them and causes Lance to be unable to use his magic. He may seem threatening, but he just wants to get his friends and leave. Lance is trying to formulate a plan of action, while Mash is busy making cream puffs, but then Lemon comes in with bad news, something has happened to Tom. He ends up going to see Tom and learns that Tom has been drained of his magical energy. Tom isn't the only one who was affected. A lot of students are out for the count thanks to this. Later that night, Lance and Mash are walking around the halls with Finn and Dot when they spot Lemon, who has been turned into a puppet. They decide to follow her into what is most definitely not a trap. Dot tries to blow his way through the door with his magic, but it is too strong. Then Mash comes up with an idea. He grabs a suit of armor and uses it as a pivot to fling the door open, and in the process, causes massive property damage. They walk in and down a hallway and end up in an arena. A guy teleports in and challenges them to get their coins. Dot takes the challenge, since he can't stand handsome people. The guy even has a fawn club. Dot doesn't even compare in popularity. They prepare to fight, while elsewhere, the headmaster is informed that six death row convicts have escaped prison. They were aided by Innocent Zero. Back to Dot's fight with handsome guy, he uses his explosion magic on the guy, but is blocked with ease. So he switches tactics, he plants several landmines around the guy and probably tells the guy that he better watch his step. All he has to do is not step on the landmines, so there's no way he is going to fall for it. Dot gets grabbed, and it looks like it's over for him, but before he is dropped, he makes a statement. 
He never said the landmines needed to be stepped on to activate. Just then, one of the bombs explodes and Dot is released. The pretty boy fell for the mines after all and gets blasted to oblivion. Just then, the ground beneath their feet begins to pull them in, and they are split up. Lance ends up being faced with the third Fang, Worth, while Dot and Finn are faced with two double liners, Love and Milo. Mash is left alone with the masked man from before, Abyss. Abyss realizes that Mash can't use magic, and despite Mash's very convincing argument, he knows for certain that Mash can't. Lance uses his magic, but his grabby magic isn't very effective against mud magic. He is immobilized and pelted with mud balls that are strong enough to break concrete. Worth tries to recruit Lance into the Langdorm group, but Lance wants nothing to do with him. He launches Worth into the wall and starts pelting him with rocks, so Worth is forced to use his trump card, his Sekanth. It is a level of magic that can only be achieved by the very best of magicians. Worth thinks there is no way that Lance would be able to use a spell of this level. But Lance does just that, he unleashes his own Sekanth, and easily destroys Worth's Sekanth, and Worth is defeated. Mash is still facing Abyss, who appears to be using some kind of acceleration magic, Mash can't keep up with his speed, and is cut multiple times. Abyss shows Mash that Lemon's magic power is being drained, and then she will lose her magic forever. Mash is now really angry, but he still can't keep up with the dart Abyss speed. Abyss stabs Mash in the stomach, but can't pull the sword out as just like Rengoku, Mash is holding the sword in his body. He then headbutts Abyss and knocks his mask off, revealing his evil eye. Thanks to that eye, anything it looks it cannot use magic, but that doesn't affect Mash though. Abyss uses his Sekant to create a force field around himself to reduce Mash's speed, while also raising his own. Mash once again cannot keep up, so instead of attacking Abyss directly, he'll smash the floor to prevent him from escaping. He then uses his foot to hold him in place and absolutely demolishes him, finishing him off with an ungodly suplex. Next is Dot and Finn's battle, Love acts all cutesy at first, and the simp and Dot nearly comes out again, but he manages to hold himself back. When Love sees she isn't getting his attention, she is prepared to kill him, that's a real leap in logic. Dot fires bombs to block her vision, and then tries to grab her wand, but she counters and blows him away. While Dot is on the ground, she tells him that Milo, the other guy, can turn the person who opened the door to stone, so Mash is going to be turned into a statue. Dot would have to defeat her in less than 30 minutes, otherwise Mash is going to die. She then traps him in a tornado. While trapped, it finally happens, Dot has his main character moment, and he has a flashback, and we all know what that means. Major power-up time, he gets a new mark on his forehead and his power has risen dramatically, Love is now outmatched and is going to get blown up. But Dot doesn't hit her as he doesn't like fighting girls and tells her to just give up. But the battle isn't over yet as Milo returns with his stone magic, he is going to be tough to beat. Or he would have been, if he didn't get smacked by a sword. It came from Rain Amos. The divine visionary and love doesn't want to deal with that, so she gives up immediately. He isn't wasting any time and pelts Milo with hundreds of swords and someone please tell me how this dude is still alive. He now tries to give up too, but he missed his chance. Rain then proceeds to give him a beating, and he won't forget anything soon, and love dips. Earlier, Rain met Mash in the hall while investigating Innocent Zero and immediately tested Mash by attacking him, but Mash is able to block all the attacks and even make a chair from the swords. He realizes that Mash isn't the one he's looking for and apologizes, but Mash doesn't forgive him. He gives Mash a healing handkerchief as an apology and warns him about Abel, he is really strong for a student, and it'll be tough for Mash to be him. Mash gets to the door for Abel's room and for once opens it normally, but then backtracks and busts the door open. Abel plans to kill off all the people who can't use magic to keep the world pure. Mash is obviously against this as he is one of the people who can't use magic, so a fight ensues. Abel throws his dolls at Mash, the dolls have acid in them, so they are kinda dangerous, but he has a solution for that, he just won't touch them, so he knocks them all down with a bowling strike. Abel pulls out the arm day puppets, but Mash has grown stronger since last time, so the same trick won't work twice. Abel realizes Mash is strong, so he uses Mash against Mash to beat up Mash. He's controlling Mash's body with strings, and Mash is actually done for. But then he stops, he claims that victory would have been too easy. Instead, he tries to get Mash to fight Finn. But when Mash frees him, he realizes he should have just taken the easy win. But now it's too late, Mash is stronger than he was a few minutes ago. When he tries using the threads to take control of Mash's body, the force Mash exerts breaks his hand, and he gets kneed in the face. He finally stops messing around and turns Mash into a puppet, and now Mash is no threat since he can't think for himself. But when he reaches into Mash's pocket to get the coin, he pulls out a cream puff, and that was his mistake, for when Mash realized that his cream puff had been jacked, he broke free of the spell and punches him. 
Now he's running out of ideas, but he has one final trick and uses his seconth. It should turn everything in a 100 meter radius into a puppet, but once again, it doesn't work on Mash since he just cuts the threads. Abel is out of options and Mash goes for the suplex, that is the face of a man who has accepted his fate and is preparing for the hospital bill for the brain damage he's gonna get. He has lost so he releases Lemon. Meanwhile, Rain has found Innocent Zero and it looks like he tricked Abel into working for him. But now that Abel has failed, he is going to kill him. Rain tries to stop him but is blocked by a butter knife which was thrown by John, the serial killer, and Cannibal. Mash and the others are still celebrating their victory, while Abel and Love watch them and wonder how long they are going to continue. However, the celebration is cut short, and Mash needs to go through the bathroom. The others take some time to take in everything that has happened, but then the innocent Zero guy just floats in and backhand swats them out of the way. He goes up to Abel and scolds him for losing the battle, he basically calls him trash and says he doesn't need him anymore, so he plans to kill Abel with his own hands. It's looking bad for Abel right now, but Mash comes back with a plate of cream puffs and doesn't understand what is going on. A fly lands on Mash's nose, causing him to sneeze and knock the cream puffs into Innocent Zero's hair. That was enough of an annoyance to make him give up on killing Abel for now to face Mash. Even though there's been more than three seconds since the food never touched the ground, Mash still wants to eat the hairy cream puffs. But Innocent Zero throws the cream puffs to the ground and Mash is shook. Innocent Zero then gets a sudden headache, which makes him realize something, the hairy cream puff loving guy before him is the person he has been searching for. But first, he still has to kill Abel, so he picks him up and throws some spikes at him. But at the last second, Abyss steps in and takes the blow for him. The blow was not fatal thanks to Mash throwing a rock which altered the trajectory of the spell, and Zero now realizes that Mash is dangerous. When one hurts Mash's friends, Mash will get angry, and when Mash gets angry, someone is gonna get some brain damage. Mash kicks a rock at Zero to inflict said brain damage, but Zero is able to catch the rock and licks it for some reason. Regardless of how weird he is, Mash is still gonna give him brain damage. Zero flies into the air and launches several spikes at Mash, which he blocks with his fists, but it seems that Zero is overwhelming him right now. Zero mocks Mash for all the big talk about beating him, he seems to be struggling quite a bit. But Mash isn't done yet, he may be struggling now. But he's also slowly pushing forward. But when Zero turns up the power, it doesn't look good for him. But the spell is caught by Abel's spell. Abel is ready to fight back. Zero launches spikes at the spell and it crumbles to the ground, but it was just a distraction to get Mash close enough to strike. And there's the brain damage. Zero is impressed that Mash was able to cause that much damage, so while thinking Mash is using magic, he pulls out a legendary mirror that reflects all magic back at the user. He thinks he has won since no magic user can beat him with that mirror. But Mash is special, he kicks right through the mirror and inflicts heavy brain damage on Zero. Everyone now realizes that Mash doesn't use magic at all. Now Zero realizes that Mash is the one he has been looking for, and maybe because he got brain damage, he decides to leave and tells Mash his real name Cell War for when they next meet. Abel promises to return the favor next time and carries Abyss to get treated. The others are freaking out that Mash has no magic, and it would be really bad if people found out. So the promise to keep a secret. But one of the students that Mash saved from Abel wakes up and snitches on them. But our boy doesn't give a shit and enjoys his cream puffs. Later, Mash tries to blow the whole thing off as if he didn't just get his secret exposed, but Finn isn't convinced and thinks this would be really bad for them. They may have managed to shout the teacher into submission at the moment, but he will eventually spill the beans, so they can't be sure that Mash is safe. And Finn was right as we see a random student walk up to Mash and ask if the rumors about him not being able to use magic are true. The secret is out, and Mash is still a terrible liar, so he struggles to save the situation. The student doesn't fall for Mash's stellar deception tactics, and the student is sure that he must be lying, but Finn isn't going to let Mash admit to it, so he drags him off to avoid further questions. The student yells out to Finn that if Mash can't use magic, then his helping Mash would make him a criminal as well. If he makes a fake report, then he may even get expelled from the school altogether, so he asks if he is really going to lie to protect Mash. Finn works up the courage to tell the student off and say that it is none of his business who he chooses to hang out with, but the student was already face down in the ground as a result of Lance's magic. The student gets up and asks what Lance was doing this for, but he says the guy's face and Jojo haircut offended him, so he acted accordingly. Lemon and Dot soon show up, and it would seem that Dot suffered injuries far worse than they had thought. In fact, he has all the injuries imaginable. After school in the Adler dorm, Mash is holding a feast in celebration of their recent victory over Lion Dorm, and having collected their gold coins, they now have enough for them all and just need to wait until the selection process begins. 
Finn feels like they are ignoring a major issue here, and more importantly, why is Abel here? He's giving off a creepy vibe, and he's still got his creepy doll with him. He speaks up and says he brought a deck of cards for them to play during their meal, but he makes it clear that he doesn't intend to become friends with them or anything. He is just here because of MASH, and also because he feels like he should celebrate Abyss's recovery. Later into the night, MASH receives mail from the Owl and gets summoned to the council to have his fate decided. The one leading the trial tells MASH that he is in serious trouble for trying to conceal his lack of magic, so he must be dealt with accordingly. But MASH has the perfect counterargument for this. Why though? One of the Divine Visionaries present, Rio likes MASH's attitude and gives him a chance to prove himself. In this world, magic is everything, so if MASH can do something that is better than magic, there shouldn't be a problem, so he makes a candle appear before him and instructs MASH to light the candle without touching it. The councilman thinks it should be impossible for someone like MASH to do so, but nothing is impossible with the muscles of a Greek god and two hours of survival documentaries. MASH lights the candle with nothing but his wand and a little bending of the laws of physics, he then proceeds to walk him away having proven himself. However, while he may have earned Ryo's approval, there are still others who take issue with his existence. Order is one such person as he believes that since Mash hid the fact that he can't use magic, then the only possible course of action is to kill him. However, an objection is heard from the councilman but not because he suddenly cares about Mash, but rather because he has had his body jacked by Innocent Zero and now looks like a meth head. Innocent Zero says through him that Mash belongs to him so he won't let anyone take him away, and as proof of that, they took the liberty of implanting a magic parasite in the councilman that had nothing to do with MASH until a few minutes ago. Magic parasites are an especially dangerous kind of parasite because they latch onto magic users and drain them of their magic. And what is even worse is that anyone who tries to take the parasite off an infected person will have it transferred to them instead. This makes it really difficult to deal with since no one wants to will and get themselves infected, but MASH just yanks that thing straight out. The parasite begins to slither down his mouth, but Mash also never skipped tongue day, so he is able to tie the parasite up inside his mouth. With the parasite taken care of, Mash has defeated the messenger of Innocent Zero and simultaneously spared the councilman's life, so he thinks that should be enough to say he's free to go, but order isn't going to be so accommodating. He tells Mash that there are rules in place and those rules say he must face the death penalty, so he orders Mash to follow him. However, Mash just goes gnaw and sticks his feet in the ground so he can't be taken away. Order doesn't have time to go back and forth with Mash, so he just uses his magic and tries to finish the execution right then and there. But before it can get out of hand, a sword is thrown into the mix as Wahlberg and Rain arrive in the courtroom. Order asks Wahlberg what the point of calling this council meeting was when the verdict should already be crystal clear. Mash cannot use magic, so for being born that way, there is no other option available other than killing him. That's what the rules say. Wahlberg already knows how much of a stickler Order can be for rules, but he asks that they at least defer the execution of MASH for a little while. His reason for the request is the fact that Innocent Zero sent out a message specifically talking about MASH, so there might be a chance that MASH will be able to lead them to Innocent Zero if they leave him alive. MASH is just now realizing that the headmaster of the school might be someone important, and important is an understatement, because he was one of the most powerful divine visionaries back in his prime, and among his accomplishments, he managed to go up against Innocent Zero on equal footing. Order understands Wahlberg's reasoning for wanting Mash alive, but he just doesn't care he came here to kill a kid, and he is going to do so no matter what. Wahlberg takes off his hat and asks once more that they do him this favor and let Mash go. Rain also takes a knee and asks them to reconsider their stance as he agrees with Wahlberg. He doesn't like the unjust treatment of non-magic users, plus Mash is someone whom he is deemed worthy of trusting. The councilman who got his brain hijacked gets back up and says he agrees with Order when he says that Mash shouldn't be spared. But with that being said, Mash just saved his life, so even if the rules say that he should be executed, this case was assigned to him to process, so what he says goes and right now he says that Mash's sentencing will be deferred. Since the judge for the case has made his decision, Order compromises but says that he will only allow Mash to go free under the conditions that he be under their supervision as a pawn against Innocent Zero, and that he proves that he is strong enough to fight against Innocent Zero by becoming the Divine Visionary for this year. If he fails to do so, then Order will personally eliminate him on the spot. Mash agrees to those terms, but proving that he is strong enough to fight Zero is not going to be enough, he declares that he will definitely beat Innocent Zero up. With that, Mash was no longer slated to be executed thanks to some good old abuse of power by the councilman, and he explains everything that went down to his friends like it was a perfectly normal meeting. Finn can't believe Mash has to deal with such a dangerous organization just to not be killed, and Lance is just shocked that it was true that Mash can't use magic. 
Dot, on the other hand, couldn't care less about the verdict of Mash's trial or his lack of magic. So he suggests that they all go out to have some fun. Out in town, Finn wonders if Dot proposed the sudden outing as a way to take Mash's mind off the troubles of his execution. But this is the first time any of them have met outside the school, so he wonders how this is going to play out. Dot is the first to arrive in the ideal male outfit, a full suit of armor. Finn thinks this is crazy, but at least Mash should look normal. I don't know what he was expecting, but Mash comes rolling in with his ab workout and Finn is seriously contemplating getting new friends. Lance shows up last and he actually looks pretty normal, but it was all a trap as he is still a siskon. Finn really needs some normal friends. After redoing their wardrobes, Finn and the others get on with their fun day, so Dot suggests the perfect game for them all to play together. Later on, the group is now heading to a magic wand shop while Finn carries Dot's near lifeless body. Lance says he would like to try out a new wand because there have been rumors that the Divine Visionary exam will be happening sooner than expected. Due to the recent resurgence of Innocent Zero, the Academy made the decision to hold the exam earlier this year to speed things up, but that works out in the group's favor since they have already gathered enough coins to qualify for the exam. The group arrive at the wand shop and are amazed by the hundreds of wands hung up on the walls. They are greeted by the owner of the shop who recognizes them to be students at the Magic Academy, so he is happy to welcome them into his shop. Fink decides he might as well get a new wand since he is here anyway, so he goes to the middle of the room and stretches out his hand, causing one of the wands in the room to react and come flying towards him. Depending on your magical energy, a wand that fits your current needs will be selected for you, and having a wand that suits you can greatly increase the efficiency of one spell casting. Lance decides to go up next and begins gauging his magic as well while the shop owner gives some explanations, and as Lance tries it out, he hits a wand that is said to be really special even for double-line mages. The shopkeeper then looks to Mash and asks if he wants to give the magic gauging a chance, but Mash has no magic, so if he goes up there, nothing's going to happen. Mash agrees to go up regardless, but before he can fail, he notices a wand on the floor and asks what that is supposed to be. The shop owner tells them that that wand has been around for ages, but it is so heavy that no one could ever lift it. There were rumors that elf water would spring up from beneath it if it were ever moved and water like that can be used to make wands of magnificent degrees, but that's just a theory. A magic theory. Because no amount of magic or muscle has ever been able to move that thing. However, hearing that there is a deadlift that has never been successfully attempted, Mash's gym bro instincts kick in, and he begins walking over to it to set a new PR. The shop owner doesn't know what Mash intends to do when he bends down and single-handedly picks up the wand and allows the elf water to flow. The shop owner is beyond disbelief and just accepts that some crazy shit just happened, so he tells Mash that he can keep the heavy wand if he wants. After they leave the store, they meet up with Lemon and the crazy captain to have fun for the rest of the day. Some days pass and the selection exam is about to begin, so Mash and the others are counting out the coins that they need to be able to participate in the exam. They have enough, so all that is left to do is wait for the exam to begin, but Mash tells the others that there is something he wants to do. He has a flashback to a chat he had with Rain when he mentioned that he wanted to go home before the exam begins, but Rain told him no. Mash is still going to go though. Elsewhere, Order is having a meeting with a man whose face we can't see, because the room's only lit by candles. Even though he agreed to spare Mash because of Wahlberg, he still doesn't like that he is breaking the rules, so he is going to do something about it. He can't have someone like him become a divine visionary, so he wants to make his request clear. He wants the guy, Margaret Macron, to make sure that Mash cannot become a divine visionary. Margaret finds it unusual for Order to ask for a favor, but he doesn't follow anyone's orders, so he will only do it if he gets stimulation from the battle. Order assures him that there will be no lack of stimulation from Mash because he was strong enough to be able. Margaret is impressed, but not enough to take an interest in fighting him, that was until Order mentioned that Mash did so without using any magic. This has gotten his attention, so he gets up and walks over to his piano before playing a song and making this face. Yeah, I don't know what's up with that. The next day, Mash went back to his pot's house to visit and the old man is really happy to see him there. He gets even happier when he sees Mash's friends walk in as he was worried Mash would grow up to be a friendless muscle head, but thankfully he is just a regular muscle head. Dot introduces himself as Mash's rival and Lemon straight up just calls him dad because she is intent on getting ran through by Mash one day as his wife. Pops apologizes to Finn for what he must have to go through with them, but he is thankful that Mash is surrounded by such good friends. He hopes these happy times can last forever. Meanwhile, Margaret is on his way to ruin those happy times because he is itching to have a fight with Mash after what he heard about him, but he isn't going to get to challenge him so easily because Rain was onto the plan is here to hold him back. 
A few years ago, there was a tournament held for the middle school division of Teenage Magic users, and every single competitor was obliterated by a single student. And that student was the 9 years old Margaret Macron, who is currently facing off against Rain. It's excited to get the chance to see what a divine visionary can do against him. But first, he takes a quick piano break in the middle of the fight. He seems to be really enjoying himself, but as for everyone else, not so much. By the time he is done playing, even Rain is confused by what has just happened, and I don't blame him. After a confusing couple of minutes, Margaret finally starts making sense again and says that not all powerful magic users strive to become divine visionaries, after all, it is just a title with no buffs attached to it. So it is not as prestigious as so many think it is. So between he who sought nothing but strength his entire life, and the divine visionary with a fancy title, who do you think will win in their clash? They now begin to fight with their unique magic powers, but just a little deeper in the forest, Mash and the others are still having fun playing a board game without a care in the world. Rain launches several swords Margaret, but he counters with him sound notes of equal strength, blowing up his swords as they collide and following it up with a sound shockwave attack which staggers him. He shakes it off and is about to cast another spell, but he then realizes that he has been caught in a web of Margaret's music notes and can't cast his spell without triggering them and getting himself blown up. With Rain unable to cast any spells, Margaret believes he has won the battle and asks him if he knows why he is going to such lengths to get to M.A.S.H. It is because he craves the stimulation of a challenge, which sounds weirder than it actually is. In essence, he hates being bored and needs something exciting to occupy his time. However to him, Rain is the very description of boring with his mainstream ideals, so a fight with him could never truly be fulfilling to him. So now, he just wants him to step aside so he can go have his fun with M.A.S.H. Rain says Mash is a straightforward and confident guy, so confident that he was able to say he will become a divine visionary even when he possesses no magic. Someone like him could possibly change the perception of magic users across the world, so he is not going to let Margaret toy with him until he breaks. His mood shifts and Margaret can tell that he seems to be getting a little more serious about this fight than he was a second ago. We get a cut to the headmaster as he explains the true nature of the lines in magic users' faces. Most people know that the number of lines is said to correspond to an increase with the absolute magic power that one possesses, but while Eastern Academy has had many double liners cross its gates, there have only been a small number of triple liners. Having two lines means that magic itself has acknowledged your talent, but to have three lines means one is chosen by God himself. And of those select few, Rain is the youngest person to ever acquire those three lines, and for the sake of changing the world, he will make sure that Mash has all the support he needs to be able to go as far as he can. Meanwhile, Mash has just been executed in the game which at this point seems like the board game has a grudge against him. He decides to go out for some fresh air to calm down for a bit, and the others think he must be really upset, but in reality, he just ran out into the middle of the forest because he didn't want to have to share his special cream puff with any of them. Coincidentally, this is the same area where Margaret and Rain are having their duel and Margaret is still making weirded faces at the realization that he gets to fight a triple liner in the flesh. However, even if Rain may be a triple liner, there shouldn't be much he can do to escape as he is still surrounded by sound-sensitive bombs, and no matter how powerful he is, he will explode the second he tries to cast even a single spell. Rain asks if Order was the one who put him up to this since he knows he is not the kind of person to take an interest in school matters out of the blue. Yet he randomly got information about school matters and the exact location of M.A.S.H., so he must have had at least a little influence from Order. M.A.S.H. lacks magic, and in this world, that is the same thing as just having no human rights so most people in his situation would be crushed under the weight of despair. But Mash deadlifts heavier things in his morning workout routine, so he won't succumb to his fate. That was a nice speech and all, but Margaret only cares about two things, the piano and fighting, and he already played the piano so he just wants to get back to fighting already. Despite being faced with Rain who is a triple liner, he is still as confident as ever thanks to his overwhelming talent. Plus the fact that with him sound trap around him, he can't cast a counterspell to defend himself right now, so Rain is a sitting duck. He casts another attack spell and believes Rain has no options available, but as a triple liner, he doesn't just have more power than most, but he can also awaken the dormant form of a wand and by doing so, summon the power of a god. He counters Margaret's spell by summoning a giant sword which he fires at him. And it is so powerful, that he is forced to go on the defensive and use his powers to pull up a sound shield to avoid dying, that even with the shield, the damage caused from the blast is still immense. Mash had been watching the entire battle, and now that it is over, he comes out to thank Rain for fighting on his behalf, but Rain says there is no need to mention it. The selection exam is coming up soon, so he wants Mash to be ready for it. However, Rain is terrible at giving others encouragement, so he just tells Mash that he will face immense challenges, 
and his failing to win will bring no good, so he has to fight and win. Elsewhere in the forest, we see Margaret escaping the scene with two dorm members. He is impressed by the power Rang showed and would have loved to go all out. But he had to put the safety of his side character friends first and prioritize defense. However, this doesn't mean he has given up on going after Mash, he is just going to have to wait for his next opportunity to face him. Later on, Mash returns to his house and decides to share the coins that he acquired from Lang's dorm with the rest of his friends so they can all participate in the Divine Visionary Selection Exam. They all have mixed reactions ranging from Dot's excitement to Lance's sense of duty to his sister and Finn's state of intense panic. And on Mash's end, he's having a nice chat with his pops. Pops had heard from the others that the school has discovered that Mash is unable to use magic and he will be executed if he cannot meet their demands of becoming a divine visionary. He blames himself for not being able to provide Mash with the normal life he had hoped for. But Mash says that regardless of all that has happened, he is still happy with how his life turned out. He has his pops there to look out for him no matter what, and even if it was only for a little while, he was able to go to school and make friends with other students like a regular kid would. He even gets to eat a lot of Korean puffs every day, so he couldn't ask for anything more fulfilling in his life and Pops is really happy to hear that. The next day is the day of the exam, and there are three stages for the selection of a divine visionary. The first is the collection of the coins by winning battles against your fellow students. The second is passing the candidate selection exam, and last is the final exam. Normally, one must acquire five or more gold coins to participate in the selection exam, but due to the recent intervention of Innocent Zero, the exam has been rushed and the requirements were dropped to only three coins. We are introduced to the people who will be participating in the exam, which we were already aware of, but in a new development, it seems like Margaret has joined the tournament as well, so Mash will have a tough battle ahead of him. As Mash is about to enter the arena, Order stands in his way and tells him that there is a defined standard of being able to use magic in this world. So if Mash can't do that, then he isn't qualified to be called a human and will never be accepted into society as long as Order has anything to say about it. So in response, Mash does a pro-chad move and takes off his shirt, proceeding to literally flex on Order, and telling him that his muscles seem to disagree. But if Order continues to stand in his way, then Mash and his muscles will just have to beat him down along with all the other opponents he will face. He then enters the arena, where the crowd's cheers turn to murmurs over the rumors they have been hearing about Mash not being able to use magic. They start heckling and yell that Mash does not belong here, and should just go home. And even though he earned the right to be here, by winning the coins for himself and his team with all the crowds yelling, now he really feels like giving up and just going home. The tournament begins and the rules of the game are explained to all the participants. They have to head into an artificially created magic forest and find a key so they can escape and qualify for the next round. Finn thinks this is much simpler than he was expecting, but then the announcer adds that they will also need to retrieve the key from a near indestructible swim bladder. And that's a little more difficult, but not all that bad. But they also need to evade these monsters that will be coming after them for their livers. The entire event is going to be broadcast to the arena for everyone to see, so cheating will be impossible to pull off and any embarrassing moments will be immortalized on the internet forever. With all the rules clear, the announcer asks if all the participants are ready to begin the round, but Finn most certainly is not. However, the show must go on so the participants are all teleported into the test site to begin the exam. One of the other participants is eager to find his key. Unfortunately for him, this guy was one of the first people to run into a butcher, and upon realizing he has been found out rather than run, he attempts to fight back against it by firing off a spell at it. However, something the announcer failed to mention earlier was the fact that while inside this artificial forest, all the butchers are completely immune to all types of magical attacks, which is information that could have been useful before now, but means that running away is really the only option available. But the school doesn't have the liability protection to just kill off a bunch of students like that. So instead of being chopped up and harvested for organs, the student was teleported out at the test site. Thanks to his elimination, all the other participants now have valuable information and know that their only chance at succeeding is to run from the butchers and find the keys as soon as possible. But there is still a problem because they were given no clues on the locations of these keys, so they are basically stuck just wandering around aimlessly. One of the students speculates that the test may be more about seeing how they can use their magic to escape an enemy that is stronger than them. Thus, this exam was made to see how well they do in a situation where their strength is not enough, and they are forced to flee for their lives. However, Mash never got the memo and has already gut-punched the daylights out of one of the butchers, leaving everyone shocked as those things are meant to be nearly invincible. However, while Mash's punch did rearrange the butcher's intestines, thanks to the magic sustaining the test site, the damage was healed a couple of seconds later. So since punches don't work and punches are kind of Mash's only thing, 
He decides that he isn't going to deal with this thing any longer and makes a run for it. As he is running, a spell is cast on him which reduces his size to that of an insect, and his diminutive stature makes the butcher lose track of him and run past. The one behind the magic spell was this student who was hiding in the grass. He calls out to Mash and explains to him that the butcher has terrible eyesight, but is pretty sensitive to sound, so as long as they stay quiet, they should be fine. He then undoes his magic spell and explains that his personal magic is able to freely change the size of any object as he wishes. Mash thanks him for offering his help even though this is meant to be a competition, but it's not an issue for him since the guy understands that it would statistically be better to work together in a situation like this. Mash's brain seems to be lighting a bit, but it eventually catches up and realizes that the guy wants to form an alliance with him. He then goes on to explain that the key they are looking for must be somewhere within the search radius of the butchers since the school wouldn't want to leave the results of such an important exam up to chance. So there must be some sort of clue to the location of those keys, but Mash's brain already flatlined from the information overload. The brain starts back up again and Mash gets what he means, at least a little, so now that her plan is to follow one of the butchers until it leads them to the key's location. Since it is sensitive to sound, Mash and the guy tiptoe around it to avoid drawing attention. But then Mash accidentally trips on a rock and has to hit the hee hee in order to not get caught. Once they are in the clear from the butcher, they spot a black balloon floating in the field considering it is the only balloon-shaped object nearby. They know that must be the swim bladder that is holding the key. There is a device under it, probably meaning that they need to blow up the balloon if they want to get the key out. However, Mash doesn't stop to think that there might be a trap in place, so once he tries, a loud sound is played and the butcher comes running after them again. That thing makes a loud sound whenever you try to use it to blow the balloon up and attracts the butchers, so if they can't use it, Mash suggests that they just destroy the balloon altogether. That's actually a pretty good idea, so after the guy makes sure the butcher is gone, he calls Mash over so he can rip up the balloon, but as he jumps on it, it makes another loud sound, so they are forced to retreat again. Touching the balloon will also attract the butchers to their location, so the guy comes up with one final plan and suggests that they break the blowing device to make the balloon deflate and release the key. However, even after they do that, the balloon remains inflated and the key does not fall out. It must be held in place by some sort of magic, but they don't know what kind so the guy can't counter it. Plus, they already broke the inflation device so they don't have many options left available. Maz takes a look at the broken inflation device and he suddenly gets a great idea. After relaying his idea to the guy, they set their plan into motion as the guy uses his magic to make the balloon much bigger. The crowd watching thinks he is stupid for making the balloon even bigger, but they haven't seen anything yet because Mash is about to start cooking. From the moves he's pulling, everyone soon realizes that he is breakdancing, but you already know that if it's Mash, it's not any regular breakdance. He creates a full tornado with how cool his moves were, and the crowd can't believe what they are witnessing. The force from the tornado fills the balloon with enough air to make it burst, and after the balloon has been destroyed, Mash is able to acquire the key, but the balloon popping made a loud sound, so they need to run away again. Back to the other participants, a bunch of them manage to acquire the keys spread across the test area. However, Finn is still sat over in a corner and cowering in fear, because he doesn't like being chased by axe-wielding goat butchers. Doc comes up to him and asks if he is alright, and since Finn hasn't managed to acquire his key yet, he decides that he will help Finn pass the test. But first, he may want to deal with the severe bleeding on his head. Meanwhile, Mash and the guy are celebrating their success in retrieving a key when Mash turns to him and says he can have the key for himself. He was a huge help in getting it, so it's only right that he keeps it. But the guy refuses and tells Mash that he should have the key instead. He points on the direction of the exit and tells Mash to hurry, because he heard that there may be a time limit in place for this test. Rain told him about Mash before he got here, and at first he didn't believe Mash was such a good guy, but after working together, he now understands Mash's nature and wants to help him out. Mash thanks him for his kindness and runs past, but as soon as Mash is out of sight, the senior's eye begins bleeding and one of the members of Orca dorm, Carpaccio, comes out of hiding. The senior has suspected that Orca would try something like this, which is why he urges Mash to go on ahead, but now he has to face him alone. Outside, the people who acquired keys have already exited the test site, and Mash soon follows as well. He meets up with Dot and Finn, who made it out as well. Lance is impressed that Mash managed to pass the test even without using magic, but he couldn't have done it without the help of his senior. Although, he still isn't sure why the senior insisted on letting him keep the key. The gates to the test area suddenly open once more, and the senior Mash was talking about can be seen exiting. It seems like everything worked out fine, but then the senior falls to the ground, and it is revealed that Carpaccio beat him to a bloody pulp. This test had no reward for beating up other participants, so this was pure unprovoked violence. 
Carpaccio is the top of the leaderboard for the continuing students, making him an elite magic user. He proceeds to step on the senior's head and call him a weakling who doesn't matter. And those who are weaker than him don't get the right to complain about what he does. Mash doesn't like what he is doing, so he gives Carpaccio a warning not to disrespect his senior like that. Otherwise, he will have to deal with Mash. Carpaccio takes offense to Mash standing up for his friend, so he grabs a glass of water that was offered as refreshments and proceeds to pour it all over Mash's head. Or rather, that is what he tried to do, but Mash was one step ahead and used the water from his hater to make a protein shake and fuel his muscles. He then casually calls Carpaccio weak and for a second, it looked like Carpaccio was ready to throw down with Mash, but the announcer broke it up and told the two that they had better save the fighting for the final round of the test. With that, they move on to the next round and the participants who pass the exam are split into teams of three with matching robe colors. This game is a team battle and is called Life Crystals. Each team is entrusted with three life crystals and the goal is to break your opponent's crystals. If all your team's crystals are broken then your team gets disqualified, so the rules are pretty simple to understand. However, Mash's brain is lagging again from processing that much information, so they simplify it down to you need to smash the other crystals. They are given their crystals and Finn is worried because he knows he is the weakest one on the team, but even if his crystal gets broken, they'll still have another chance with Mash. Never mind, he already broke his. Oh, this is bad but it is still salvageable as long as Dot still has. Now that they are down to only Finn's crystal, they'll be knocked out of the exam if anything happens to it. But Mash and Dot promise they will do their best to protect his crystal for him. Not like they did a good job protecting their own, but whatever. After a brief intermission, the tournament continues and the participants are teleported to their new test. Unfortunately, the plan of Mash and Dot protecting Finn isn't going to work out since they are all separated after they are teleported. On the other guy's end, they realize they are screwed if they don't find Finn soon before he gets defeated by the first person he meets. Meanwhile, Lance is glad that he didn't get put on a team with them because they are in really bad shape. Finn also realizes how bad it is for his team, so he swears to himself that he will protect his team's last crystal with his life. As he walks through the maze, he comes across one of the yellow team's students who is currently begging Carpaccio to spare him, however, Carpaccio is always on violence time, so he doesn't know the meaning of the word mercy. Finn notices that he has a knife in his arm, but as he twists the knife, rather than him being injured, the guy on the floor has his arm bleed even worse than it already was. Once the guy passes out from the pain, Carpaccio goes on with his speech on how he is more talented and superior in every way, so the nameless characters should all just stay out of his way and lead their insignificant lives. As Finn watches this happen, Carpaccio begins to walk off and he knows it would be bad news if he ended up finding out where he was hiding. So he tries to erase his existence as a living organism and blend into his surroundings. Yeah, that didn't work and Carpaccio is now standing right behind him. So Finn's worst nightmares are coming true as Carpaccio is out on violence time again. Finn is almost willing to get down on his knees and beg for his life here. But all of a sudden, Carpaccio just stops and calls him by name. He recognizes Finn as the person who just barely managed to meet the cutoff for the school entrance exam. And as someone who has a burning hatred for the weak, he feels nothing but dissatisfaction whenever he is reminded of him. He always wondered how Finn could even manage to get into this school in the first place, but now he has managed to weasel his way into the Divine Visionary Selection Exam. He is starting to believe that Rain might be manipulating things to give his brother an advantage, but that aside, he tells Finn to just hand over the crystal, because someone like him doesn't deserve to win. Finn is intimidated and considers handing over the crystal, but then he remembers that the hope of Mash and Dot are resting on his shoulders. He needs to make a choice here whether to prioritize himself or the crystal, and he chooses the crystal. But as soon as he makes that choice, his body begins to violently bleed. He doesn't know what just happened to him. So he assumes it must be the magic of Carpaccio and Carpaccio is standing there, feeling insulted that Finn would even think about fighting back against him. He is literally the weakest person in the whole school, so even if he fought, he would be guaranteed to lose the battle regardless. Carpaccio says people like Finn should just stay submissive and breedable, so if he hands over the crystal right now, he won't have to feel any more pain. If he doesn't, he's going to end up like nameless character number 3 over there. Yet even with every fiber of his being currently screaming out in pain, Finn still grips onto the crystal tighter. Meanwhile, Mash is making a mad dash to locate Finn and Margaret is casually walking through the caves, thinking about how this exam has three very interesting students. One is Mash who can't use any magic, the other is Lance, who is the top transfer student at the school. And finally, Carpaccio. However, Margaret always imagined Carpaccio to be the kind of person who doesn't care about titles like Divine Visionary. So that must mean Order cut him a deal as well to get him involved. 
Carpaccio is a prodigy who was chosen by a powerful wand, so it wouldn't be an exaggeration to call him the strongest student in the entire school. And Margaret is truly thankful that there is someone so powerful in the school that can excite him. Meanwhile, Carpaccio is still torturing Finn and doesn't get why he is choosing not to give up the crystal. At any point, Carpaccio could physically just take the crystal from him, but he is feeling insulted that Finn has held out for this long. Finn continues to tell himself not to give up because if he can hold out long enough an opening will present itself, while Carpaccio is looking down on him. He hasn't used his personal magic up till this point, so know that Carpaccio is distracted, he pulls out his wand and yells dangerous. This causes Carpaccio to brace himself for what may be coming, but it was just a bluff and Finn used that time to escape and put some distance between them. Carpaccio isn't too bothered by the flimsy attempt at escape since he will be able to catch up to the injured Finn in no time. But as Finn runs down a flight of stairs and Carpaccio follows him, he casts a spell and swaps the position of Carpaccio and that nameless student whom he had beaten up, thereby putting some extra distance between them. He bluffed earlier so Carpaccio wouldn't be expecting the change magic, so now he's got a little extra time to run away. However, despite his best efforts to flee, Carpaccio was still able to use his magic to put a hole in Finn's leg, essentially crippling him for the rest of the fight. By now, Carpaccio thinks Finn must already realize how pointless it is to try to resist him, so if he acts like a good boy and hands over the crystal, this whole mess can just end. However, despite being in agonizing pain, Finn chooses to keep his grip on the crystal. Carpaccio is getting pissed now, so he gives Finn the London Back Alley special and stabs himself in the chest repeatedly, inflicting that damage on Finn. The crowd is starting to think Carpaccio may be going too far now, and Finn's refusal to let his friends down only further annoys him, so he is now going to slit his throat. If he actually goes through with it, the Finn will die, but before he can go through with it, Mash arrives and smashes Carpaccio's head into the wall. Mash thanks Finn for holding out so long, but as he walks over to check on him, he realizes that his forehead is now bleeding. Carpaccio finally starts giving an explanation on how his magic works, but Mash has had enough long explanation for one exam and knees him in the face. Unfortunately, Carpaccio remains unharmed and Mash receives the blowback from his own attack. Carpaccio goes on to say that his magic transfers all damage he takes to his opponent, so if he gets hurt in any way, like for instance a knife to the leg and the damage will be transferred to whomever he considers to be his opponent, and his own damage will be healed. Consequently, all pain that he experiences gets absorbed by the Master Came Wan that chose him, whether he wants it or not. So since the very day he was born, he has never felt any kind of pain. Personally, he wants to feel pain at least once, but someone like Mash could never manage to deal any damage to him, so he wants to just get this over with quickly. He begins stabbing himself some more and the damage gets reflected to Mash, so this is basically an unavoidable attack. Mash is staggered by the stab wounds, but he regains his footing and lunges forward to punch Carpaccio. However, that too is reflected back at him, so Carpaccio tells him to give up because nothing he does will work, but even knowing that his punches will be reflected, Mash continues to deliver punch after punch. Carpaccio tells him that what he is doing is pointless since a person's fate is determined by the abilities they are born with. The same applies to Finn over there who has been a loser ever since middle school. He was always compared to his brother but was always just a step away from flunking. Finn is a failure and doesn't belong in a school like this. Mash understands that Carpaccio has a point here. Finn may be weak and yes, the only reason he made it this far was because of Mash and Dot, but when he just went through for the sake of defending his friends, took real strength to do, so he won't allow Carpaccio to look down at him any longer. Mash gathers his strength and primes his muscles before dashing forward, punching Carpaccio right in the face. And even though he feels the damage being reflected back at him, he continues to push forward and strike with more power and speed. Carpaccio realizes Mash is trying to overwhelm his magic's capacity to absorb damage, but he still thinks it is a pointless endeavor because a simple plan like that could never work. However, he is proven wrong moments later as the goddess statue that absorbs his pain develops a crack on it. He never knew there was a limit to how much damage it could withstand, but as long as a limit exists, Mash is going to get past it. He begins attacking even faster, and after one powerful uppercut, the statue begins to scream out in pain and Carpaccio is knocked back. Having finally broken through his invincibility, Mash states that he is a million times stronger than him, and now knowing that he is up against an opponent that is far stronger than he is, will have the courage to hold on like Finn did. Carpaccio doesn't understand the kind of body Mash possesses to be able to crack the statue, but he is unbelievably happy because he finally met someone who make him feel something. Even though the statue is cracked, it doesn't mean Carpaccio has been defeated yet as it just reacts differently when he takes a lot of damage. The statue transforms into a monstrous nurse and begins throwing needles towards Mash. 
forcing him to run and dodge out of the way. Carpaccio is enjoying himself as he finally gets to do battle with someone who can challenge him, so he's going to try not to kill Mash immediately. After the initial barrage of needles, Mash stops for a second and pulls out that ridiculously heavy wand he got a while back and begins molding it with his bare hands and forming a tennis racket. He then uses that racket to strike the statue with a light speed serve and then starts playing tennis off its head while still dodging the needles. And with each and every rebound, the statue begins to take more and more damage. Until finally is completely destroyed. With the statue gone, Carpaccio is now just a regular dude, and after Mash is done with him, he's going to be a regular dude who is in a lot of pain. Mash has now decisively defeated a Master Kane user and thanks Finn once more for all he has done to help. It is all thanks to him that Mash will be able to continue living his life as he pleases. He goes over to help Finn up while Carpaccio is still bleeding out on the floor. This is the first time in his life that he has ever felt pain, and he now realizes that it kinda sucks. It is such a terrible feeling. So he now understands just how much willpower Finn must have had to withstand all that pain for Mash's sake, and Finn is far stronger than he could ever be in that regard. While all that was going on, the trial is still in full swing as we get to see what Margaret has been up to this entire time. He is facing a couple of magic users from the red team and proceeds to explain to them that he can tell how strong someone is by the sound he hears from them, and right now, he is hearing that these guys are complete and utter trash. He doesn't want to waste any more precious breath talking to them, so he says they should just put their crystals down on the ground and get out of his sight while he's still in a generous mood. These guys still think they are capable of putting up a fight against him because it's a two-on-one. So they both simultaneously launch their spells which consist of rocks and wolves. However, Margaret simply casts a music spell and completely obliterates their attacks. The two then try to shield themselves with their magic, but that does nothing to stop it as they are still blown away by the attack. The two are left unable to move as Margaret walks up and picks up their crystal. He makes it clear that they are nowhere near his level. And now that the rest of the red team have been eliminated, the trial has come to an end. And coincidentally, Doc did absolutely nothing for the entire round, but a win is still a win, so he has nothing to complain about. But while there is definitely cause for celebration, the area falls silent soon after as the crowd braces themselves for what is to come. Now that they've both made it to the finals, that means Mash will have to face Margaret sooner or later, and speaking of which, he is standing right behind him with another creepy smile on his face. He is excited to finally face Mash, but he chooses to be patient and wait for the finals to begin, so that he walks away until next time. Mash knows he has to be careful this time because the sheer pressure Margaret was giving off was enough to make his muscles twitch to warn him of the danger. Meanwhile, in the spectator stands, one of the Divine Visionaries goes up to Headmaster Wahlberg and states it will be difficult for Mash to move forward with his plan of becoming a Divine Visionary now that Margaret is competing. The reason Rain was able to become a Divine Visionary with an overwhelming victory was largely due to the fact that Margaret did not participate in the exam last year. As the head of the Magic Talent Committee, he has analyzed all the students taking part in this exam and Margaret is a clear favorite to win, especially with his incredibly powerful Sukhanth. Walber has to agree with him on that point, but he still believes Mash is capable of turning the tables on him with his unconventional fighting ability. Meanwhile, in the locker room, one of the nameless students who lost to Mash is holding a grudge against him. However, he is smart enough to know he stands no chance against him in a fight, so he settles for asking Margaret to beat Mash up on his behalf. He could even slip some laxative into Mash's afternoon protein shake to mess him up a little, but while Margaret has been tolerating his annoying voice so far, he will not stand for anyone attempting to weaken Mash before he gets to fight him, so he blasts the guy into a wall with one finger. That includes order as well, so he promises not to get involved in the fight as long as Margaret is able to keep his end of the deal and beats Mash. Meanwhile, Mash is in the other locker room giving his life backstory. He first started working out because his pops told him to, and he didn't like it at first, but after doing it for so long, he can proudly say that he pumps iron just because he can. If there's a dumbbell nearby, he's going to lift it, that's just how it goes. But then the Divine Visionary from before shows up in a locker room and asks Mash if he would like to play a little game he made. No. Mash knows how these kinds of things go so he straight up refuses to indulge in any games because he wants to rest before his match comes up later. Unfortunately, the Divine Visionary uses abuse of power, so he says that since he is in charge of judging magical talent, if Mash doesn't play his game, then there's no way he'll be allowed to pass the Divine Visionary exam. Knowing his chances of winning are on the line, Mash caves and agrees to play the game, but it wouldn't be fair if he didn't get anything for winning, so he offers Mash a guaranteed pass on the next test if he wins. The game is a simple one of if you look you lose, so Mash is ready to play. But there's a twist to it as Caldo draws his circle in the ground and explains the rules of the game to him. Mash needs to stay in the circle while Caldo counts down from three, 
and if by the end of the countdown he is not looking in the direction he was pointing at, Mash wins. They'll go for three rounds and if Mash can win all three, then he will be declared the victor. Fid knows those rules put Mash at a ridiculous advantage, so there must be something Kaldo neglected to mention about this game, and that becomes apparent as the first round begins and Kaldo points upward. In order to not look there, Mash turns his head down, but Kaldo launches a strike from below, forcing Mash to have to look up to dodge it. Mash manages to dodge the strike while looking to the left, but the game's not over yet as Kaldo points in two directions next, and sends two attacks towards Mash to get him to fail. However, Mash is still able to hold his ground by blocking the attacks with his fists and looking down. Kaldo is impressed he is able to take down an attack like that with his bare fist, but a trick like that won't work for him a second time. He pulls out a sword covered in black flames, and these flames are enchanted to burn whatever they come into contact with until there is nothing left, so he can't risk touching that thing. Mash wants to give up, but Kaldo isn't going to let him in points in three directions before charging at him with the sword. Mash dodges the strikes while tiptoeing around the circle, but he needs to look down or else he will lose, so he faces the floor and Kaldo takes the opportunity to strike at him from below. Mash will now be forced to look upward if he doesn't want to be burned to death, so it is checkmate. However, Mash was playing checkers, not chess, so he sticks his feet in the ground and hijacks the portion of the floor with no the circle in it to dodge the strike without leaving it, all while still looking down. This isn't against the rules so it looks like Mash has won the game or at least he would have if an owl didn't steal Mash's cream puff immediately after, and because it was a cream puff, Mash instinctively looked at it and lost. Kaldo was satisfied with Mash's performance, so he decides to call it a draw, but he warns him that at his current level, it would be difficult to face Margaret. He has accomplished what he came here for, so Kaldo takes his leave for now. Mash is still thinking about something, but when the others ask him what is wrong, he just says he is glad Kaldo took it easy on him, because he could have been in trouble if he hadn't hesitated for a moment there. Plus, he didn't make any rules against it, but he chose not to cast any real spells at him. As Kaldo was leaving, he thinks to himself that Mash is completely out of his mind. For a moment back there, he was going to try to block the infinite burning flame sword with his head, that's not to say Kaldo doesn't find the idea of having a crazy guy like him on their side intriguing. He'll be rooting for Mash to get strong enough to stand with the Divine Visionaries. A while later, the final selection exam is about to begin, and it will be done in one-on-one -on -one battles where the victor will be declared once your opponent is incapacitated or gives up. And now that the rules have been explained, the first matchup is set to begin. Mash walks out and is set against Margaret who tells him he won't be able to win this fight as easily as he had done with the previous ones. The best he's going to do is be an amusing battle for Margaret to enjoy. Mash doesn't agree with that, but before the match begins, he calls for a timeout because he would like to have a cream puff before the fight. And coincidentally, Margaret would also like to have a snack and pulls out a shrimp he had in his pocket before aggressively dipping it in some tartar sauce. Mash tells him to take it easy on the sauce, but he is mistaken about something. Margaret isn't eating shrimp with sauce. He's having sauce with a side of shrimp. Only a madman would do something like that, so those are the eyes of a crazy person. And from what we've seen so far, the more crazy someone is, the more powerful they are. With power of his level, it is clear why Order didn't bother trying to mess with Mash anymore after he got Margaret to take him on. He believes the skill gap is so great that there is no chance for Mash to make it past this fight. Margaret unleashes his magic power and it is so immense that Finn can feel it, all the way in the stands. Mash charges forward at Margaret, who then proceeds to launch a basic magic spell at him. Normally, this would have been easy to catch, but the amount of power that was out into the spell forces Mash backwards and into a wall. However, once the dust settles, Mash has disappeared and pops up behind Margaret before grabbing him and using his 200-meter vertical jump to plant his head in the ground. Everyone believes Mash may have just won, but if you're wondering how he managed to escape the blast that sent him flying, Finn saw it all happen. Mash realized he couldn't stop the blast, so instead he just ran back to avoid getting hit and escaped right before the collision. After the suplex he gave, any normal person would need intense spinal surgery, but Margaret is just getting warmed up so the fight continues. Meanwhile, in the dark stormy skies, a hooded figure is approaching the arena on the back of a dragon, and he has certain plans for Mash. After the craziness the crowd just witnessed from Mash, they are starting to think he might actually be able to use magic. And if you're wondering how Margaret's spine isn't folded like a pretzel, it's because he was able to use his magic to create a sound cushion and soften the blow before he hit the ground. In any case, Margaret is ready to get some more action from Mash, so he begins to fire off more basic spells at him. Already knowing he can't block the spell, Mash dodges out of the way and begins running around the arena as Margaret pelts him with spell after spell. And after some sick moves have been displayed, he manages to get behind Margaret and is about to throw a deadly punch. 
Margaret notices this and tries to turn around and counterattack with his wand, but then Mash hesitates for a moment, leading to both of them pausing mid-attack. Margaret can tell that Mash is holding back because there is something he wants to safeguard, and he is right since Mash pulls out a precious cream puff from his jacket. If he continually protects that thing, then he won't be able to fight to his utmost potential, so Margaret calls for a break so he can set it aside. But do not be mistaken, Margaret isn't doing this because it is fair, he's just doing it so he can get a more entertaining fight out of Mash. The entire stadium is in uproar over the events that have transpired so far, but it is clear that neither Mash nor Margaret has gone all out yet. They are still just testing out each other's limits, and although Margaret's second puts him at an advantage overall, if both sides were to go all out right now, the match may end in an instant. Margaret and Mash get back into fighting position, and he unleashes his first unique spell. A collection of magic sheet music that forms a fist. He launches it at Mash, who tries to counter with a fist of his own, but dude. It's sound, and as expected, he is unable to punch the sound away, leading to his eardrums taking the full front of the attack and spewing out tons of blood. Margaret informs him that his spells are not something that can be battled with mere fists alone, but Mash currently has the hearing of a 90-year-old grandpa, so he has no idea what he was just talking about. Margaret launches more of these sound waves, and Mash tries to brace himself against them, but the sound still passes through his body, and no matter how durable he is, internal organ damage is going to leave a mark. The fight is looking to be a one-sided beatdown, and Mash has just realized he won't be able to block the damage from Margaret's magic, because the injuries are all internal. He is disappointed that Mash won't be able to give him the fight he was looking for and plans to finish this quickly, so he casts an even more powerful spell that summons tons of instruments that are all aimed directly at Mash. The sounds begin playing and the area begins to crumble under the force of the vibrations that were unleashed, but while everyone thinks Mash must have been done in by an attack of that scale, Margaret realizes that he can't see Mash's corpse anywhere. This is when he gets his foot grabbed and his entire body pulled underground in one swift motion. Everyone in the stadium is confused by what just happened as Mash climbs out from the ground and to explain exactly what he did. He may have had trouble if he had to take a direct hit from that spell. But would he lose? Nah, he'd dig. Mash dove into the ground as the sound waves were about to hit him and proceeded to tunnel his way over to Margaret since the vibrations were dampened by the ground. But that still means he did all that faster than the speed of sound. However, we'll move past that for now since Mash is lining himself up to punt Margaret's head for a field goal. If his spine wasn't broken before, it definitely just snapped in two from that kick. And everyone in the stadium feels the same way as there should be no way Margaret stands out from a hit like that, or ever again for that matter. But Mash is thorough and leaps into the air and onto Margaret's laid out body before proceeding to deliver a fist straight to the face, followed by an overwhelming amount of punches all straight to the face which some may call overkill. But this is a powerful opponent we're talking about and Mash understands that if he doesn't finish him off now, he'll regret it later. Unfortunately, the punches did not cause enough brain damage to kill off Margaret, but rather only served to make him happy that he finally gets to fight an opponent who can really push him to his limits. Margaret states that Mash is formidable, so from now on he will be fighting him in his most powerful form. Right light erupts from behind him as the transformation begins, and Mash just lets it happen, because why not? Margaret's body begins to change shape and take on a more beastly appearance. But once all the dust has settled, he still looks human and now has hair on his head. Margaret is now in his true form and praises Mash for being powerful enough to make him use this, but he'll have to live up to the expectations Margaret has of him. While all this is going on outside, the divine visionary Rio is feeling worried about Mash's selection exam, but he makes himself feel better by looking in the mirror and remembering just how handsome he really is. Just then, an urgent report comes in and Rio is informed that Innocent Zero has begun to make his move. From what they already know, it is clear he is after Mash for some reason. It's not clear what they can do in this situation, but the first order of business is to organize security so they can defend the school. But until they can do that, Order and Caldo are just going to have to hold him off since they are already present in the stadium. He asks for some clarification on which member of Innocent Zero is heading there right now, but unfortunately, it turns out that is the leader of Innocent Zero himself that is coming after MASH, so this may be worse than he initially thought it would be. Back at the stadium, tensions are running high as everyone waits to see what Margaret Form can do, but Mash points out that Margaret has turned into a child, but it's not like he has a problem with punting a kid if he has to. Margaret points out that he hasn't simply turned into a child, but rather, this is the form his body naturally takes when he is unleashing the true nature of his magic. And to demonstrate, he snaps his fingers before appearing right next to Mash and blowing air into his ear as a prank. This surprised Mash and made his body tingle, 
but the question of how Margaret managed to teleport is still left unanswered. Margaret begins to explain that unleashing his magic means he has access to many more spells than he did before, but Mash doesn't want to sit through another explanation. So he just throws a punch at Margaret again. However, he has a smile on his face and once again disappears before the punch can actually land on him. Mash wasn't able to see what happened, so he starts looking around to see where Margaret went and gets his attention called to his opponent who is chilling out in the stands. Doesn't make sense that he was able to make it all the way over there in an instant, but as he was trying to explain earlier, in this form he is the incarnation of sound itself. He snaps his fingers once more and appears right in front of Mash before kicking him clean across the face and knocking him back. Mash begins to think Margaret may have muscle-based attacks just like him since he is fighting with his body, but that is not the case here. He begins to dash all over the place and Mash is unable to follow any of his movements in the slightest. Right now, Margaret is literally traveling at the speed of sound. So if Mash wants to have any hope of catching him, he is going to have to move his body at speeds that surpass that of sound. And that is proving to be a challenge for him as we see Margaret teleporting around as Mash tries and fails to land hits over and over. He then starts attacking Mash with his own series of hits and frankly, Mash is looking like he's done for. The attacks land at the exact same moment you hear them coming, so unless he can find a way to figure out when the attack is coming before it actually hits, he won't be able to win. Mash gets back up and has his hand against the arena wall, as Margaret commends him for being tough. But toughness alone won't be enough to win him this battle as he snaps his fingers again and travels towards Mash at the speed of sound, about to land a finishing blow to end the fight, but as the kick was about to land, Mash suddenly disappeared. Everyone is shocked that he managed to dodge that blow and he soon appears behind Margaret who is confused more than anyone right now. The reason Mash was able to dodge what should have been an unavoidable attack is because the hand he placed on the wall allowed him to feel the attack coming slightly ahead of time, thanks to the properties of sound transfer being faster in solids. But even with that fractional time warning, it was still thanks to his otherworldly reflexes that he was able to dodge at all. Mash winds up his fist to attack Margaret, but he isn't worried because he can always just use his speed to evade the blow. However, as he tries to snap his fingers, he finds that they have been covered in tartar sauce, so he is unable to snap and gets hit with a devastating close line. Mash is finally even the playing field, but this is just a temporary solution as Margaret still has his sitcom at his disposal to be used at any moment, so it can still be said that Mash is at a disadvantage. Margaret gets back up and says he accepts Mash as a worthy opponent, so he will now be throwing everything he has got him and unleashes his Sekhanth. Right lights emerge as the Sekhanth is summoned, and once it is complete, a giant bell is spawned right in the middle of the arena. This bell has the effect of incapacitating anyone who hears it, and it will begin ringing in one minute, so the only way for him to stop it is to steal Margaret's wand before that happens. But that isn't going to be easy since Margaret will be running away the entire time at the speed of sound, so he has to figure something out quickly. Margaret snaps his fingers and dashes behind Mash, so the race is on for Mash to catch up to him in one minute. They dart around the arena and Mash is stuck a few paces behind Margaret every turn, but time is running thin, so he needs to find a new tactic soon. There are now only the seconds left before Margaret's Sekhanth will activate, so Mash takes drastic measures and digs his hands into the ground to perform a serious table flip, which launches a large chunk of floor and Margaret. He is now pinned between the wall and floor heading towards him. Mash takes this opportunity to launch himself at him now that he only has two routes of escape. He can either go left or right, so Mash just needs to figure out which one is going to be and catch him before he can escape. Margaret ends up running right and it seems like he was about to escape, but then Mash turned to follow him, and with just the strength in his pinky finger, he was able to grab a hold of Margaret's cape and pulled him in before punching him down and destroying his wand to put a stop to his spell. Margaret has thrown everything he can at Mash, but it has all been countered and he can't even complain because he enjoyed every minute of it. He admits defeat and Mash is declared the victor of the match, meaning he is one step closer to becoming a divine visionary and after watching him fight, he has managed to change the opinions of most of the students who once booed him off stage. He was about to leave the arena when all of a sudden intense pressure is felt all through the area and a crack is formed in the sky. Innocent Zero emerges from the crack and uses his magic to stop time for everyone in the arena before making his way down to the floor to retrieve Mash. He holds Mash's face while he is frozen and talks about how worried he was that he would never have Mash alive again after all, he is his dearest son. He wishes to incorporate Mash into his body to become truly complete, and with everyone frozen, it looks like nothing can stop him. However, Headmaster Wahlberg possesses the power of counter his time magic, and for the sake of protecting Mash, he will stand against Innocent Zero. 
As the headmaster of Easton Academy, he cannot just let them pull up on his property and just abduct one student without a fight, so he will defend Mash with every fiber of his being. Even if it kills him. One of the criminals, Innocent Zero, came with praises Walmart for being powerful enough to not be phased by time stop magic. But he still thinks he'd be no match for all of them at once. However, after Walbert merely looks at him, this scissors wielding side character gets a reality check as the bloodlust hits him like an axe. It was at this moment that he realized he picked the wrong career plan and may actually die like this. Fighting an old man while trying to kidnap a teenager. And all while having a room for a haircut. Innocent Zero gets in front of him and asks Walberg to stop intimidating the side characters, so Walberg asks what his true objective for coming here is. Zero reveals that he wishes to become the perfect human being, immortal and all-powerful. Walberg thinks a goal like that is childish and dumb since Zero has sacrificed countless lives and ruined many more for it. However, Zero still doesn't see how many of that should be of concern to him since it will all be worth it for him to become perfect. His family exists for the sake of his goal, and that includes Mash as well, so if he wants to take him. Wahlberg isn't about to let that happen, so if Zero refuses to leave got a fight, he sure as hell going to get one. Wahlberg unleashes his power and two extra lines form on his face, so Innocent Zero does the same as the two get ready to settle their magical beef. They both summon their wands and face off, but Zero never said he would play fair as he has a backup plan in place for such an event. Dozens of monsters emerge from the ground, and they seem to be hungry for human flesh. At this rate, all the frozen students will be eaten alive, so he uses some of his power to unfreeze a few of the most powerful magicians there so they can handle the situation. He'll explain everything later, but for now he has to deal with Innocent Zero so he entrusts the lives of everyone else to them. Though not much information was given, they all understand the assignment and get at work destroying the monsters. The Divine Visionaries want to hurry this battle along so they can get to Wahlberg's side and help him battle Innocent Zero, but the monsters are no cakewalk either. A simple stab attack is ineffective, so Caldo is forced to use the flame enchantment to cut through them. Some try to sneak up behind him, but Order was there and ready to assist his fellow Divine Visionary. He too is surprised by how powerful these monsters are since each and every one of them possesses enough power to be on the level of a double liner. And their sheer numbers are troublesome as well so it doesn't look like they'll be able to assist Wahlberg. They continue to slay the monsters with everything they have while the face-off between Zero and Wahlberg goes on. Zero asks if Wahlberg is really okay with leaving this fight to the hands of so few students, but he has confidence in their ability so he tells Zero to just focus on himself. He uses his magic to teleport them both high into the sky, so that they will not be interrupted by any outside forces. Meanwhile, Dot and Lance are still doing their best to keep the other students safe from the monsters, but there seems to be no end to their overwhelming numbers. Just then, they turn around and notice a giant pillar of iron spikes, and at the top of it is one of Innocent Zero's children, who is currently creating a humongous iron spike ball. They realize that he plans to drop that on the stadium, and if he actually does so, the damage would be devastating. However, they can't do anything about it since there are special monsters designed to keep them busy. Everyone is fighting for their life here, however, it looks like none of the monsters are targeting Mash at all. Margaret thinks about it and realizes that they must be baiting Mash into a trap because they have a surefire way to get to him, Margaret's woman's hunch is almost never wrong about things like this, so Dot tells him to leave this place to them for now so he doesn't get captured. He is the only one who can stop the giant iron ball that is about to drop on them, so he needs to get on that right now. He understands and immediately starts running to take down the giant tower. It is so tall that it would take way too long to climb, so instead after staring at the guy for a bit, he just gets into stance and starts kicking the tower down one level at a time. Once he is done, he has come face to face with him as he begins to explain that the spike ball won't disappear until Mash defeats him. He has been looking forward to a rematch, but Mash has no clue who he is despite having fought him a couple of weeks ago. He tries looking for a way to get himself out of this, but he really just doesn't remember, so he apologizes. Meanwhile, Dot and Lance battle the monsters with their special magic, along with Margaret and the Divine Visionaries. But even though they are tearing through tons of them, there is still no end to their numbers. Just then, Dot notices a stroller in the middle of the battlefield, and that is suspicious as hell. However, while he was still confused, the baby starts speaking and ends up turning him into a baby with his unique magic. He then reverts himself to normal and proclaims that he is one of the criminal canes. His magic turns the target into a baby, and as most people know, babies are only capable of being cute and pooping, so Dot won't be able to fight back anymore. He tries to use his magic while he is in his baby form, but he is unable to produce a strong enough blast, so he is forced to crawl away and retreat. He crawls past the monsters and gets Lance's attention, but Lance doesn't seem to understand the severity of the situation and believes Dot is just messing around. 
Moments later, the baby spell is cast again, but Lance notices it ahead of time and dodges out of the way. He now knows what made Dot turn into a baby, but it's not like that solves the problem since he still needs to protect Baby Dot while also fighting the monsters. It would have been manageable if Dot didn't run away to chase a rattle, but a baby is gonna do what Baby does. Lance chases after him, but that leaves him open to be transformed into a baby as well. Things are looking pretty bad for the both of them as they are now both helpless against the monsters. But the baby instincts still cause them to go after the rattle and into danger once more. The criminal walks up to mock them before he punts the babies since they have no chance of winning. In that baby form, they are only able to use one-tenth of their usual magic power, and that won't be enough to beat him. However, as he instructs the monsters to attack the babies, they are all thrown to the ground as Lance uses his spell. He shouldn't have enough power to take them down like that, but Lance made up for the difference in power by limiting the range of his gravity spell by one-tenth. That way, it maintained its potency despite the smaller size. Dot is amazed at how capable Lance is he was able to recognize that the caster's magic was strong, but his body was incredibly weak. He's truly a genius mage of the times. Kaldo takes a break from monster slaying as well just to praise Lance's capabilities to turn the table on such a desperate situation. Meanwhile, Ryo is making his way to the stadium to assist in the fight against Innocent Zero when he is asked to elaborate a bit about the relationship between Wahlberg and Innocent Zero. He explains that the entire magical world was shaped by one man with unmatched power. His name was Adam, and it is said that he possessed power equal to God, so no one could dare to stand against him. Wahlberg and Innocent Zero were Adam's two best students, which would lead you to believe that they are roughly equal in power, but the fact that Innocent Zero made the effort to invade the stadium today means he must have at least some amount of confidence in his ability to win this fight. And if that's the case, then they need to be careful. Innocent Zero tells Wahlberg it has been quite the hole since they were able to meet like this, so he's quite happy. But as he pulls off his hood, what Wahlberg sees is horrifying. He's bald, he's also missing all his facial features, so there's that as well. He transforms his face back to the real Innocent Zero and Wahlberg questions if he has really abandoned all humanity just to pursue his goal. On the contrary, Innocent Zero tells him that he has never felt more human before and since he is so human, his desires are immensely deep so his greed is equally bottomless. And for today, he has two greedy desires. One is to take Mash back, and the other is to make sure Wahlberg dies today. He activates a time spell, and from the way Wahlberg is looking at it, you know this is going to be bad since what Zero just did is considered a forbidden spell. Back to Mash, he still doesn't remember who this guy is, and as a matter of fact, the only thing he can think of right now is a cream puff, so he isn't even taking him seriously. A giant carbon spike is thrown his way, and after seeing that attack, Mash finally remembers him. He also takes the opportunity to bring up the fact that he had heard that Abyss managed to survive even after he got stabbed through the gut by one of his spikes. They are really resilient, but after he is done with Mash here, he will make sure he goes back to finish the job and kill them properly. Now that his friends are being threatened, Mash is going to take this more seriously. And that's just the kind of response he wanted as he begins launching spikes at Mash nonstop. From inside the stadium, Dot hopes Mash is handling himself well enough since last time he fought that guy, he was able to trick him by hiding inside one of Abel's dolls and punching his face. But he doubts that same trick will be fallen for again, so Mash must come up with something else. And as we cut back to Mash, we see that he indeed came up with something else as he is just running on the spikes. This only serves to anger the guy because he is being made fun of, but as he fires off more spikes, they still don't do much in terms of damage since Mash can run on those as well. No matter what he does, Mash just keeps getting closer until he finally gets within right hook range, and the right hook knocks him back so far that I'm sure even his father felt it. He doesn't understand how Mash is overpowering him so easily when the last time they fought, all Mash could manage to do was barely keep up with him back then. Mash explains that sure it was tough the first time, but he has already seen the move once, so why would he fall for the same thing twice in a row? Adam was the legendary magic user who was blessed with overwhelming power and single-handedly created an education system to teach it. He also created the Bureau of Magic, so his influence was felt throughout the entire magic community. However, he spent his last years providing social assistance for those who could not use magic, so he taught his students to take care of the weak. One of said students was Wahlberg, and now Zero has just revealed that he has brought their master back to life. He is proud of his achievement, but he was only able to bring back the time spent in the body, so the mind is still lost forever. But with the body fully functional, another magic user called Necros can take control of it. Wahlberg is having a hard time coming to terms with what just happened, but he still raises his wand to fight. Necros reminds Wahlberg that although this is Puppet, it is a great man whom he once called Master. So as he makes Adam fire a spell at Wahlberg, 
he immediately gets overwhelmed by the amount of magical power he had. While Walber is struggling against the blast, Zero explains that although their master was powerful, he eventually succumbed to his old age. However, Zero has gone through the liberty of restoring his body back to its prime, so Adam is the most powerful he has ever been. Their master had the highest magical energy output in history, and Zero always held a grudge because the man had always treated Wahlberg as his favorite. Wahlberg remembers having a chat with his master about the topic of protective weak, because you are strong. At the time, Wahlberg did not care about the concept of protecting people, so he said as much to his master. His argument was sound, but then Adam started ranting that a student is not meant to refute their master no matter what. Of course, he was just joking, but the fact he has an opinion like that simply means he is still too young to understand the difference. Adam had faith that Wahlberg would figure it out one day though because he is strong. Back to the present, Wahlberg repels the spell that was shot at him and begins talking about how Adam was the greatest man he knew, but times have changed since then. If the body of his master is being used to throw the world into chaos, then he won't show any mercy. Nikros is aware that Wahlberg currently stands at the top of the world in terms of magical power, but that's just in this current era, so he is sure the former strongest magic user will be enough to take him down. He then makes Adam use his personal magic which carves a hole straight through a mountain. It is explained that Adam's dark magic is able to return everything to the void, it covers everything in darkness so Wahlberg will soon be enveloped as well. He launches a darkness snake spell at Wahlberg, and his is just barely able to dodge it, leaving his rogue slightly damaged. He realizes that the body of Adam here truly is in its prime, and since this is the great power that Adam used to control the entire magic realm with, Wahlberg shouldn't be able to compete. Dark magic is magic that sends anything it touches to the void, and it even sends other opponents' magic to the void as well, which means once it is cast, dark magic cannot be repelled by any other spells. That is the reason Wahlberg didn't bother trying to counter the darkness snake and dodged out of the way instead. He knew he wouldn't be able to counter it, since he is well aware of the magic's traits. Nikros is really enjoying himself with this battle and greatly appreciates how good of a toy Adam's body is. He will keep it with him every moment of the day from now on, and even in the shower. He then proceeds to launch two darkness snakes at Wahlberg, but as they collide with him, he ends up being perfectly fine. Nikros somehow believes what he just did must have been a fluke, so he fires another darkness spell to make sure. But this one is also repelled as well. Walber then follows it up by casting a spell that sends blue objects towards Nikros, and once they hit, a huge chunk of his face and torso ends up going missing. He starts screaming out in terror, so Walberg explains to him that there is no need to worry since his body parts just went on a brief vacation. So while his arm may be in New Jersey right now, he won't die from it. It all makes sense to Nikros now, and Walberg slashed the space he was occupying, just like he did a moment ago with the darkness spells. So now that he knows Walberg has a way to deal with the darkness spells, he comes up with the ingenious plan to just shoot more spells at him. However, as the spells are cast, the result is clear since Wahlberg was able to block all of them with ease. Nikros has got nothing left at this point and doesn't understand what is going on. He is using the man who was hailed as the most powerful magic user in the world, yet Wahlberg is overpowering him so easily. He can't stand for this as he believes dark magic is one that stands at the pinnacle of all magic, so it should never lose. He uses Adam to launch the most powerful darkness spell available and creates a giant darkness ball overhead. This darkness ball is sent flying towards Wahlberg and Necros is certain that Wahlberg's magic won't be able to handle a spell of this power level. Wahlberg only laughs and corrects Necros on one thing. Up till now, Wahlberg hasn't used his true personal magic, it was just the wand. So now that he is ready to take this seriously, he will show Necros what a real spell looks like. Wahlberg casts Space Sacrifice and completely eviscerates everything in front of him including the darkness spell, Adam's body, and Necros. Wahlberg says one final goodbye to his master, but Zero returns and is quite shocked that Wahlberg is still as powerful as ever despite being an old geezer now. Wahlberg retorts that this old geezer is about to do the same thing to him. Back in the stadium with all the students frozen, the unfrozen ones are still trying to keep them all safe by taking out the monsters, but there is almost an infinite supply of them. At this rate, they will eventually run out of magic, but Order just tells Caldo to quit whining about it and do what he needs to do. He was just analyzing the situation, but he would really like to go help Max with his fight right now. Yet, if he were to leave this place, the students would all be in great danger of being eaten. Over on Mash's end, he and Innocent Zero's henchmen, Cell are just standing there when Mash asks something he has been wondering for a while now. 
Why is he being targeted in the first place? Since Mash really doesn't know, Cell enlightens him on the existence of the forbidden magic of body construction. It is dark magic used to create an immortal heart from the hearts of six blood relatives. This is why Innocent Zero chose to have six children. So he could take their hearts when the time came for him to acquire his perfect body. So in other words, Mash is just a creation of his father meant to be a part of his perfect body. That is quite the shock for Mash to hear. But Cell tries telling him that it is an honorable thing to be used for his heart if it means Zero gets his perfect body. Information he just received was pretty hard to process, so Mash decides that he will take a nap so he can wake up from this terrible dream. Unfortunately, he wakes back up and Cell is still standing there, so he realizes that this is reality after all. Now that he knows his origins, he asks if Cell happens to be one of his brothers then, but that isn't the case. Cell is merely a clone that was created by giving some of Zero's blood to a corpse, so he is nothing more than a paw being used for the sake of Zero's ultimate goal. He has always been jealous that he wasn't one of Zero's sons, since he wants to be inside Zero really bad. But even though Mash gets the honor of doing so, he isn't grateful for it at all. He says Mash's life is worthless anyway, so with his own hands he will. Unfortunately, we never find out what he was going to do because Mash got tired of listening to him talk and punched him in the face. He doesn't care if he is Zero's son, or if his life is supposedly worthless, so if Cell wants to do something, he is welcome to try. Cell gets up, and is determined not to let himself get manhandled any longer. He can understand that Mash is no joke in strength after two punches from him, so he will be going all out from the very beginning. He uses his wand's full power and Mash is amazed, but also kind of bored at the same time. All the others can see the ominous glow coming from Cell, but they are unable to do anything to support Mash. Cell states that Zero only needs Mash's heart, so anything else is fair game for him to be sliced apart. He uses his diamond discs to try to cut Mash, but he was able to dodge them, leading to the destruction of one of the school buildings. Cell proudly proclaims that his diamond-tipped destructive discs can cut anything in the world, and they will continuously follow him until they have sliced him to pieces. Mash is forced to repeatedly dodge the discs, but this will never end at this rate, so he decides that the best course of action is to go after Cell himself, however, as he tries to approach, he is stopped by two discs, and has to back away. Cell is keeping two on standby to protect himself from Mash getting too close. Mash now thinks he is at a pretty bad disadvantage, but Cell warns him that if he attempts to flee at all, then he will cut down all the students in the stadium as punishment. He creates a giant spike ball over the stadium once again, and you will destroy everything Mash has come to call home, including all the friends he has made up till now. He throws two Destructo Discs at Mash, but before they hit him, he just turns around and starts running away. It takes a minute for Cell to accept that Mash just ran away, but does that mean he actually chose to abandon his friends to save himself? A moment later, Mash appears behind him and is clinging to his back hard. Cell realizes that he must be planning to take him out by allowing the Discs to catch up and hit both of them, but that won't work on him since he has the ability to make his skin as hard as diamond. Now, nothing Mash can do will be able to damage Cell in any way, so he gets hit by the discs and falls to the ground. Cell stands victorious over Mash's body, but as he steps on his head, he suddenly realizes that it has turned into a cream puff, at which point Mash starts stuffing cream puffs into his mouth until he can't breathe anymore. It turns out that Mash gave up on trying to beat him with a disc and decided to choke him out instead, so in one second, he used his muscles to cut off blood flow to his head and knock him out immediately. With Cell out cold, his magic was dispelled and Mash now stands victorious over his body. Meanwhile, over the skies of Easton, Rio and Neri are still on their way to the stadium to provide assistance, even if it has already taken them like two whole episodes at this point. Upon closing in on the school, Neri enters the range of Innocent Zero's spell, and as a result, he is completely frozen in place. Ryo is worried about his assistant, but there's nothing he can do to help him right now since even the birds are frozen. He concludes that someone must have cast a time stop spell on the whole school, and it will freeze anyone who doesn't possess enough power to resist it. Unfortunately, this means he has got to ditch Neri and handle the rest on his own. He makes his way down to the stadium and finds both Caldo and Order standing amongst a sea of monster corpses, so he greets them and says he's glad they're alright. He's also impressed by how many monsters they managed to take out all on their own but they have to give credit where it's due since they had a little help from some of the students. That aside, Ryo asks what happened to Mash since he was the main reason for Innocent Zero's attack in the first place. However, there's nothing to worry about on that end, either since Mash is perfectly fine. In fact, he is having a nice cream puff meal over the unconscious body of Cell whom he had defeated. 
Ryo gives him high praise for defeating Cell and emoting in him as well, but there's still the question of where Innocent Zero is right now. Order informs him that Wahlberg is currently fighting Innocent Zero, but they do not know where the fight is taking place. Wahlberg teleported himself and Zero away, so the students here wouldn't get caught up in the battle. But even now that they've ensured the safety of the students here, they aren't able to go assist him in battle. MASH volunteers to go look for him, and if you're wondering how he will manage to do that, he's just gonna run around until he spots the fight. Order doesn't have even an ounce of faith that MASH will be able to find anything since he can't use something as simple as detection magic, but there's no harm in letting him try. In the meantime, Order decides he's going to begin interrogating Cell to find out everything he knows about Innocent Zero's plan. Divine visionaries are the law of this world, so to go against them is considered nothing but evil, which also means Order has full jurisdiction to put some dirt in Cell's eyes. However, before that happens, Order's attack is deflected by a magic barrier that was placed around Cell, nullifies the magic, and then transports him to safety. Margaret comes up behind them and points out that Cell was most definitely still unconscious when that magic was activated, which means there is someone else here who is helping him. They have to investigate this, but it also means they can't afford to leave and help Wahlberg just yet either since there may still be a criminal lurking in the stadium, and that would put the students in grave danger. Knowing this, Caldo asks everyone to stay here for the time being and internally apologizes to Wahlberg for not being able to go help him. However, he believes he should be fine since Wahlberg embodies the pinnacle of sorcery, so there's no way he could lose. Still, in the event that he does actually fumble the bag on this one, Ryo needs to be ready to step in and save him since he is the second strongest magic user in the world right now. But since he can't do that, he's leaving it all up to MASH to provide that assistance if he can find Wahlberg. Meanwhile, the fight between Wahlberg and Innocent Zero has just begun to heat up and Innocent Zero acknowledges that Wahlberg is still every bit as dangerous as he was when they were younger, so he'll be taking that into account in turn, causing Wahlberg to remain cautious of what Zero might do for his first attack. Soon after, Zero starts things off by using his time magic to freeze everything in place, but since Wahlberg was able to recognize it ahead of time, he uses his space magic to teleport himself out of the way of the time spell and straight into Innocent Zero's blind spot. He thinks he should be able to catch him off guard from this position, so he casts a powerful space slashing spell. However, Zero managed to get himself out of the way by manipulating time again, and with Wahlberg now wide open, he is able to land a clean time spell on him, turning his arm and half of his face into a wrinkly old raisin. Zero confidently threatens to do the same to Wahlberg's legs next, and there's nothing he can do since Zero caught him off guard. And on top of that, He's been firing off time magic like it's nothing, but being able to do it that many times without any backlash is simply inhuman. However, Wahlberg's no pushover and he never expected this fight to be fair in the first place either, so he simply decides that he will cut away all the space around both he and Zero. And he'll keep doing it in case Zero ruins time to escape the first attack. Thus, there should be no way he survives this attack. After his attack is complete, Wahlberg is winded and has to take a breather, but we find out that his attack did absolutely nothing to stop Zero. He is still floating there untouched, which means he must have stopped time just before the space magic hit him. And once again, with Walber wide open, Zero hits him with another time spell that turns him partially to dust. He once again tells Walber that it is useless to try to fight against him since the power gap is simply too wide for him to overcome. While Walberg kept focusing on protecting others, Zero is focusing on himself and how to get stronger with his magic. A human who doesn't know how to be selfish is weak, and that weakness has grown apparent in him. So Zero thinks it's a shame, but he's going to put an end to Wahlberg's selfless life. Wahlberg stares down the barrel of the wand and his life begins flashing before his eyes as he recalls his childhood. He had an especially frail body, and his grades were a thin line above absolute failure as well. In his youth, he had absolutely no friends and no goals to accomplish, so he started skipping school since he had no reason to want to go. He lacked confidence and because of that, he chose to stay isolated so others would never have the chance to reject him and he was content to live the rest of his life alone. However, all that came to an end on the day Adam began taking the time to mess with him. He kept on pestering him over and over until he would decide to return to school once more and there was nothing he could do to stop him. One day, he decided to ask Adam why he went so far to spend time with him when he is such a boring kid and Adam answered that he simply didn't want to leave him alone. Those words struck a chord with him that day, so in the present he gets up and tells Zero that he isn't wrong for choosing to live for his own sake as he has done, 
but Wahlberg places equal importance in living for the good people around him. So no matter what, he will not abandon them. If he's going down, then he's going to make sure that zero down with him, therefore he's going to unleash his most powerful spell. His third's domain. Both he and Zero are transported to a dimensional subspace where Walber pulls out his giant mech and proclaims that this is Uranus' inclination. The power within his wand is that of unavoidable sky carving, so within his domain, no matter what kind of magic Zero may try to use, it will always be cut away along with the space it was in. Zero can't believe Walber would go so far as to use his thirds, but you turn half the man's body to dust, so what did you expect? Walber begins a spell which will delete everything within this space, so there is no way for Zero to escape this attack. However, just as the spell is about to be completed, Zero simply hits pause and stops everything within the space. He proclaims that there was no way he could ever beat someone who controls time, and his defeat was destined to happen from the very moment that they crossed wands. But, as a courtesy to an old friend, he promises to make Wahlberg's death as quick and painless as possible. He then proceeds to launch several spikes at Wahlberg, which stabbed him repeatedly. Time begins to move again, but Zero is confident that Walberg won't be able to survive with those wounds, so the fight has met its conclusion. However, Walberg is stubborn as hell, so even with half his body missing and a dozen holes in the parts that are left, the spell is still going and will be cast. Zero doesn't understand what's going on since a fatal blow to the caster will always stop the spell as well, however, that's where he's wrong. Walberg explains that while that usually works with normal spells, when it comes to thirds, the spell comes directly from the wand. Meaning, if you dump enough magic power into one of these, then the wand will complete the spell all on its own. Wahlberg had been saving up his magic over the course of the entire fight to finish things with this last spell, even if it means he has to die along with Zero. He has been watching the students of the Academy, and he has seen how they risk everything to defend their friends. This world would be so much better if people were accepted with their differences and lived peacefully. But to make that happen, Wahlberg needs to save the ones who have the best chance of making it come to pass. The spell goes off and both of them are caught up in its blast radius, so a bright light shines through the sky and radiates out into the real world. The others see the magic that was in the sky and recognize it as Wahlberg's spatial magic, but then the spell begins shrinking, so they start having a bad feeling about this. Once the spell has completely faded away, Wahlberg is completely exhausted, but Zero is still standing as though nothing happened. Walbert tries to grasp what could have possibly happened, and he soon realizes that Zero must have reversed time to the moment before the spell was activated. And as such, he received no damage from the attack. Zero resumes his attacks by launching more spikes at Walberg, so Walberg is forced to counter despite his fatigue. He manages to block most of the needles, but one manages to get through and knock his wand out of his hand. That was the last bit of strength Walberg still had in him, so he's about to plummet to the ground. However, Zero isn't letting him off so easily as he grabs Wahlberg by the hair and is about to split his head open to end things once and for all. Wahlberg accepts his fate, but before he is killed, Zero receives a knee to the face from Mash. I have no idea what Mash is standing on, but he proceeds to answer the question Wahlberg had asked him when he first arrived at this school. What would he do if he was faced with an opponent that was overwhelming in power? The answer is simple, he'd smash their face in. This was the end of episode 10. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.